Good evening, y'all. Welcome back to another Sunday Night Fundamentals of Arduino stream. You know me. I'm Jeff. I'm Jeff Glass, because you're here on the channel called Jeff, Jeff Glass, Glass. There's Jeff Glass is at the bottom of the screen over here. Like, it's hi, I'm Jeff Glass. Oof, y'all. It's been a... <laughs> I'm just having a goofy week, um, but I'm excited to be back with you here on Sunday night. You know, I even forgot to get our little our little timer going that tells us when we're going to start this thing. We'll get that started up. You'll be happy to know that I've uh, I've changed my mouse settings in advance this time. So those of you who are just here for the hot mouse cursor changing uh, action, sorry to disappoint you, but um, I will have to push that back for <laughs> for another week. Oh man, it's good to it's good to be back here on Sunday night. I think we'll uh, I think we'll have a good time tonight. Um, I'm really excited for tonight. I've I've been thinking about so this is uh, week number seven of these formal ones. Hi Chris. <laughs> Hi Brian. Hi Michael. Um, we uh, no, there's this is number seven. I did one sort of casual one before that. I think I think Chris was here for that one. It was very very all over the place sort of before I started to make this a thing more of a tech test and. Um, uh, the last three, I feel like, have been really talky. Like, we started off really strong. We did, like, digital I.O. and software setup in the first one. We did analog stuff in the second one. We did motors and servos in the third one. And for the last three, we've done, what did we do? We did fundamentals of electricity was number four. We did transistors and FETs was five. And last week was, like, coding practices. And I don't, I don't regret any of those because those are super, super important topics. Um, and especially, like, the transistors and FETs one, I think, was a really nice blend of theory and practice because using transistors and FETs to do high power things or higher voltage things is super valuable. But I was looking back through the slide decks that I made for each of those weeks, and I feel like we did a fair, a fair amount of talking and not as much uh, on the workbench as we possibly could. Um, so tonight, um, though there's still going to be a few slides because we all like slides, um, we're going to focus a little bit more on doing stuff on the bench. We're going to write some more one-off code. Um, we're going to play around some things. Um, and it's going to leave us a little more time. Like I, I was looking back through last week and was like, oh, there are people being like, or especially the week before transistors, like, could you do this? Could you do that? And I just felt like I had so much to talk about that I, I didn't necessarily indulge everyone's question about what you could and couldn't do tonight we just got some tools on the table and i have some stuff planned um but uh but tonight's a good a good night to ask like oh what if you uh what if you wanted to do this or how would you implement that um so i think we'll have a good time just because i always forget to mention it in case there's anybody out there who's watching who hasn't watched before all of the slides and all of the code that we're using tonight or at least the code that i've prepped in advance is on the website jeff.glass slash electronics bash you go to the link for episode seven you'll find all the all the code and all the slides there um none of the the wiring is particularly complicated so um maybe worth just pulling it out of the slides um the most complicated thing we'll be dealing with tonight is uh is one of these little guys, which is a an LCD display, um, but we'll uh, we'll get to those a little bit later. I want to touch on multicolor LEDs first. So tonight we're going to talk about multicolor LEDs and uh, and these little these little dot matrix style LCD displays. Um, before we kick off, I should say tonight my night is being brought to you by Gate Crasher. I am um, a special uh, place in my heart. Um, a couple of years out of college, my wife and I actually worked on a project that did some theater in non-theatrical spaces around the city of Chicago. <clears throat> and we were a part of a team that mounted a play in the back room of Temperance Brewery, which was pretty cool. Um, a really good place to hang out before, during, and after a show. Um, so very tasty. That's great. What are uh, what are y'all drinking out there tonight? I'm curious. Again, it could be just a water night. Like this is not, you know, this is not alcohol pressure, or maybe a little bit, but you know, I'm just curious what's uh what are you sipping on while we're hanging out together? Mm. Michael's mentioned in the chat. We had a little back and forth, I think, on somebody's Facebook wall. There are the the wiring of the specific like breadboard usage of some of these LCDs can be a little bit tricky, so something to watch out for for sure. Um, but while y'all are popping off with uh, what you're drinking, Chris drinking nothing yet. Chris, at least water, at least hydrate would be nice. Uh, ooh, Angry Orchard Rose Cider. I assume it's Rose Cider, Kenneth, and not Rose Cider. Although Rose Cider would be fascinating. Um. Rose side? I don't know. Maybe maybe not in a great way. <laughs> um, but let's uh, let's kick it off tonight. So uh, this is obviously not the putting it together episode. I just didn't change the title card. Um, here's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about multicolored LEDs and LCD text displays. So um, our multicolored LEDs are going to fall into two basic categories, bicolor LEDs and tricolor LEDs. So LEDs with two colors or three colors. I hope that uh, is all totally self-explanatory. And 
LCD text displays like the kind that we had sitting on the table earlier. We're just gonna play around with them, see what you can do, see how you can use them. Two or more LED, one out of, say, getting started with Arduino kit, yours probably looks something like one of these top two here, either a clear or a frosted plastic package with um, probably four leads. Um, mine that I'll be using today actually looks like this one down on the bottom here, routed to these little pin headers. So it's it's literally exactly the same wiring as any of the ones that are free floating. Um, I think just because all the rest of the modules in the kit that I have were soldered to these little stupid per circuit boards, this one is too. So just because mine looks a little different, it'll work exactly the same way as any of the loose ones that you're popping off with. Excuse me, this Temperance IPA from this Gatecrasher IPA from Temperance. Oof, maybe I should have a little more of it. That'll clearly help with the uh, enunciation tonight, I'm sure. Oh, very tasty. So, uh, what's inside a multicolor LED? Now that we know what it looks like, what's happening in there? Um, well, multicolor LEDs, like I said a moment ago, typically are just multiple different colors of LED that have some of their physical connections, some of their metal pins tied together inside the device. And much like some of the setups that we've seen in previous weeks, they come in two flavors. There's this common cathode flavor where all of the uh, the negative sides of the LED, the downstream sides, the cathode sides are tied together, and you have your individual positive sides broken out and made available to you. You might also have a common anode LED where you have a shared positive and three individual negatives, so it's three individual cathodes that you can attach to, right? So, uh, Unfortunately, both types of LED tend to it can look exactly the same. The reason that these diagrams are sort of identical is that you can't usually tell just by looking at the pins of an LED what type it is. Um, so if you're ever in question as to like what kind of LED came in my kit, because a lot of kits are like, oh, you have an RGB LED, here's four leads, go to town, and won't tell you what kind it is. I want to remind you of a little trick that we looked at a few weeks ago for figuring out whether your setup is common anode or common cathode. So I'm going to, for this demo, make use of, what do we use? Why don't we use this little guy? Um, and I'll explain the workings of it in a second here. But here's a little, it's a little two color LED. So I have one common and I have uh, no, I, uh, two individual hots or maybe two individual um, minuses, two individual anodes or two individual cathodes. And I, let's say I'm not sure which, and I'll show you how you figure out which is which. So I'm going to take a resistor. Well, of course I put all my resistors away this week. I was so good. I cleaned up the whole office. I cleaned up my whole desk. And of course now I can't find anything. So I'm going to take a resistor. I just pulled off uh, a common low value one. This is a 470 ohm resistor. A 1K resistor would be perfectly safe. Uh, what I'm going to do here is hook it up to five volts. I'm once again going to use my bench power supply, but you could use the five volts straight off of your Arduino. That would work just as well. Oh, I see what I'm saying here. It's just taking forever to find anything because it's so clean. All right, let's turn that power supply on. And I'm going to select a random uh, connection. By random, I mean, I'm gonna choose either the hot or the minus to connect this resistor to. Uh, I'm gonna choose uh, the, the downstream, the negative side, but it doesn't really matter. Let's zoom out a little bit there. And let's, I'll tell you what, let's get this guy out of the way. Get out of here. So what I'm going to do is take my uh, take my other probe here and connect it directly to any of the three probes, any of the three leads on my LED. And then I'm going to take my resistor, I'm gonna zoom back in now, and just run it across. <laughs> Thanks, kind of, yes, Jeff, the Jeff chest look. <laughs> just gonna gently probe the other two pins on the LED. So I can see there, I've got my positive on this, say, left leg. And when I touch the negative to this center leg, it turns on. So I know that for the red LED, this left side is my anode and this center is my cathode. So either I have a common cathode LED and the center is the common cathode, or I have a common anode LED and this, this side is my common anode, right? So I know where one LED is. So now if I probe this side, Ah, so I see this is not turning anything on if I probe the right side of the uh, the circuit board there. So I know that uh, I probably am not dealing with a common anode uh, situation, because if it was, this would turn on the other color. What I have is common cathode, and the center is common, I think. Let's find out. So I'm going to hook up the other side. I didn't prep this in advance, so hopefully this works. There we go. When I probe the center there, I get my other color, which in this case is green. Right, so because I have this resistor in line, I know I'm never going to be pushing in my case more than 
I don't know, 10 milliamps through the thing. We could go through all the math like we did a few episodes ago, but a 470 ohm resistor, a 220 would be fine, a 1K would be fine. Um, just make sure that I'm doing something in sort of a current limited way. So no matter what I do, no matter where I put current, I'm not gonna be putting in so much that the, the LED blows up. Right, so now I know that my center pin is my common cathode, and I have two anodes, two positives on the outer two connections here. It's funny, that's actually different from what the labeling on this little circuit board says, so um, I'm glad we tried this. We learned something. <laughs> That'll be useful later. Get those resistors out of the way there. So, once you've determined uh, whether you have a common cathode or a common anode LED, you drive them both in pretty much the same way. Um, and they look something like this. Um, those are going to look a lot like the LED driving circuits that we've used in previous, uh, previous Sunday evenings, um, where we have a positive voltage, say in our common cathode example here, have a positive voltage, a current limiting resistor. We'll go through, through one of our LEDs, and then in the case of our common cathode, where we have this common downstream side here, we'll just tie that directly to ground. In the common anode case, we'll connect our, our common directly to our positive voltage, our VCC up here. Remember that VCC symbol that we saw last time? with the, uh, the little IC chips. VCC just means your supply voltage, your power rail, right? So connect that straight to positive. You get your LEDs again with their, with their anode side, their positive side will be connected straight to that. This would be your common pin in that case. And then you have three individual current limiting resistors connected in this case to you three more uh, control pins, let's say, of an Arduino. One thing to remember is that in this case, in the common anode case, your output value will be reversed from what, say, your analog write value is, which is to say when this pin here, let's say the red pin goes high, it uh, goes to five volts, which we normally think of as turning on, that will cause this red LED to turn off because we'll have five volts here, we'll have five volts here, so no current's gonna flow through that red LED, right? So to turn this red LED on, we would need to pull this red pin low. So uh, high is off and low is on. Um, which we've seen a couple times before, right? When we were working with PNP transistors a couple weeks ago, we saw how sometimes that, that logic gets inverted from what we're usually thinking of it as. Um, in our case, right, if we're using something like analog write, um, which is um, the value you provide to analog write uh, tells you the proportion of your time that your pin is spending at its high or 5% level, then if you give it a large value, let's say 240, it's, uh, it's at five volts most of the time, that means that this red pin here is going to actually be off most of the time. Can we remember this is on only when this pin is low? Hopefully that sort of makes sense, right? In our common cathode case, which I'll, I'll be working with tonight, your analog write values are directly, you know, low is uh, on less, high is on more. When you have the situation where your LED is turned on when your control pin is low, you, everything sort of gets inverted, if that makes sense. Um, so, and just a, a, a neat point of illustration. So I'll be working with a few different multicolor LEDs tonight, some of which are through hole, like the ones we were looking at a moment ago, and some of which are this surface mount type that are meant to be placed onto a circuit board by a robot and then have the solder melted onto them by an oven. And what's cool is you can take actually really neat close up pictures of them, really showing that it is just three different little tiny LEDs that are glued together into the same package. So um, you can think of them functionally much like three separate LEDs. Sometimes they will combine pins. In the case of these surface mount ones, sometimes they don't combine the pins for you. Um, something to look out for. But I, I just really like this picture because it really, it drives from the point there's nothing magical about a multicolor LED. It's just multiple LEDs stuck together. So I promised you we were going to spend more time, uh, more time looking at code and looking at the table tonight. So let's do it. Let's load up our first code example. And if you're following along, I, I can't ever remember if I say this or not. I think I did tonight. All the code is on the website's over here. All the code is on the website. Um, feel free to pull it down and play along with us, or if you're following along after the fact, feel free to pull it down and have a stroll through. So let's pull up our first example. This will be our uh, RGB set example for those who are playing along at home. We'll load the IDE. We'll zoom in a little bit here. And you guys, last time we liked this view where we didn't have the uh, didn't have the table in the way when we're just looking at code. So I think we'll try and stick with that tonight. Um, 
So this code is going to look um, pretty straightforward for those who've been following along for the past few weeks and done our, especially our analog, uh, our analog evening in week two. Um, here's what it looks like. I'm going to attach my bike, my three color LED um, to three separate output pins in my Arduino. I'm going to define which pins they are. They're going to be pins three, five, and six in our case. And the reason that they're three, five, and six, if you recall, is that only some of those digital output pins have the ability to be analog outputs to do that pulse width modulation that we talked about a few weeks ago. And those are, for the Arduino Uno specifically, pins 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11. If you ever forget, you can of course look it up online, or let me pull up this guy here. You can see on almost all of them, even the cheapest of knockoffs, you'll see uh, next to the little pins, see 3 has a little squiggly line next to it, 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11, just to remind you which ones have analog output capabilities. So I'm going to define where my uh, my three LEDs are going to be connected. I'm going to, in my setup function, define them as output. This should all look very familiar right now. Um, and then I'm going to use this set LED color. Um, I'm going to come back to this a few times tonight. All the set LED color function is, it's a function I wrote for myself, and it's uh, a function where I can hand it three integers, R, G, and B. It will do an analog light to the red pin for R, an analog light to the green pin for G, and an analog light to the blue pin for blue. Piece of cake, right? Let's come back to that. Um, so th this is just because often I'm going to want to set all three of those colors at once. Um, so this is a, a function I wrote for myself so I can just say, hey, uh, make that LED this combination of colors and I don't have to worry about it. You could set the uh, analog values individually every time you write to the LED, totally fine. I just find this a nice sort of convenient way to sort of package that up. Um, and so in our loop, I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to start by setting the LED color to 25500. So in our case, remember that is red will be 255 or full, green will be zero, and blue will be zero. So we'll start all red. And then I'm just going to cycle through a series of combinations of uh, those colors at full or off and wait a uh, thousand milliseconds or one second in between with this delay function that we know so well. So let's take a look at the circuit that we're going to use on the table, and then we'll run the code and hopefully it'll all work. So, where is my Arduino that I'm using for this? I'm just lousy with Arduinos these days. There we go. Lousy in the sense of I have lots of, not lousy in the sense of I'm bad at, although some days there is that too. So I'm gonna be making use of uh, this little surface mount mounted on a little adorable circuit board RGB LED here. Um, again, it will function just the same as any of the through hole ones that you have to play with, but this is just the one that came in my little kit. And mine is very helpfully labeled. I have a minus here. I have my common cathode R, G, and B labeled across there. So if I didn't know that, I'd have to do that probing with a resistor to figure out what's what, but uh, <laughs> for my sake, they're already labeled right here. And I'm gonna plug that into my circuit board. See, I've got some multicolor wire already set up. I'm gonna plug that in there and just verify my wiring connections. And of course you can see all of those wiring connections are passing through these current limiting resistors before they go to the anodes of the individual colors on that LED, right? So I've got red through a resistor to the red pin, blue to blue pin, green to green pin. And I have this little return wire here coming back to the ground rail of my uh, breadboard. And of course ground is connected back up to the ground pin on my Arduino. So I'm just gonna double check that everything looks good because I haven't looked at it since sent this afternoon, and I think we're okay. There will certainly be times when these uh, these little wires pop out of the Arduino and it'll start doing interesting colorful things, but for the time being, that will work just fine. Let me make sure that my board is set up correctly and upload. And assuming it does, we'll see things start to happen. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Here, I wonder, I think, let me turn the lights off a little bit. Yeah, Jeff after dark Arduino. Let's see, what is not connected here? It looks like there's no blue coming out of it. So that's not a good sign. Why would that be? Looks like a loose resistor or a loose wire. I told you, <laughs> didn't I just say that there would be times tonight when there would be loose wires and they would do exciting things? Let's see, I'm in three. Oh, I'm in the wrong connections. I'm in three, four, five instead of three, five, six. There we go. So now I've got my Arduino cycling through <laughs> an arrangement of colors here. So what I've got for you here are the three primary colors of light and the three, I think of as the secondary colors of light, right? Our LEDs themselves are red, green, and blue. If we mix red and blue, we get magenta. If we mix red and green, we get yellow or amber, although in our case, it's, it's a pretty shitty amber. Uh, and if we mix blue and green, we get cyan. And at the end of the loop here, I'm actually going to white as well. Just to, what happens when you turn all the colors on at full. So I've got red, 
magenta, blue, cyan, green, yellow, and white. Just stepping through the various combinations of each color on at full with one of its neighbors throughout the course of you know our loop here and at the end you can see i'm setting everything to 255 255 255 that's everything on this is the fundamentals of driving an rgb led right you see you have three pulse with modulation channels or if you had an led with more than three colors and there are some out there um, you're typically not seeing them in discrete packaging like you see um you know with this little guy sitting on the table you more see them in that led tape product you see them in uh in this kind of product like we looked at last week, but you're starting to see, hi Palmer, you're just in time for us to talk about LED tape. Um, you're starting to see more than three colors wrapped up into surface mount LEDs on LED tape specifically. Um, you're starting to see ones that have red, green, blue, and white. And often you get to pick the color of white. So do you want warm white or do you want cool white or somewhere in between? You're also now starting to see um, red, green, blue, white, white. So red, green, blue, cool white, and warm white, all in a single emitter package here, which is super cool. Um, I haven't seen, although I'm sure it's coming, the, the next logical jump is red, green, blue, white, white, UV, um, because a lot of like specialty applications call for UV light or indigo light to be mixed in um, to, your, uh, to your product as well, or mixed into your lighting source. What did I say? Or warm, whichever white you want. Did I say cool white twice? I might have. <laughs> Uh, like I say, it's going to be kind of a goofy, a goofy night this week. But yes, yeah, so there's all kinds of all kinds of products. And so if you were to drive, coming all the way back to the point, if you had an LED with more than three colors in it, you would drive it in a very similar way to this three color LED. You would just need more pins. Um, if you had an RGBW LED, um, you would have to first figure out, is it common cathode or common anode? Um, and I should say some of these surface mount products, you really do get an anode and a cathode for every LED. Um, it's just that most of the surface mount ones like you get in a kit that have this common this commoning of the anode or the cathode together. Um, but you would just hook up another current limiting resistor and another um, analog output pin and you could drive it sort of very similarly to how you're driving this one, if that sort of makes sense. Um, so this is this is one way we could think about, oops, there you are. This is one way we could think about driving the color of these uh, RGB LEDs. Um, but individually sort of setting like, you know, I want red. Oh, well, that's red parameter at full. Oh, I want magenta. That's uh, that's red and uh, blue at full. Uh, which, which one is red? Which one is blue? Is not the most natural way, I think, to think about color um, when you're going to be working specifically in fully saturated colors. Um, a lot of the times what we're looking for, do a, a lot of lighting shifts this evening, is like, I want full red, full blue, full green. If you look at like the, you know, the window of a car dealership, they're not monkeying around in pastel colors. They want the flashiest, purest colors they have. And so you're always working in this sort of fully saturated range. Um, so one way that might be more useful for your application in thinking about that is to wrap up this set LED color function in a new function that more accurately represents the fact that we really only want colors that are as saturated as they can be. Um, and this will be jumping to the uh, RGB color wheel demo if you're playing along at home, a new bit of code here. Um, that's gonna give us a way to define our color on a single axis. Um, so just this bit of code will look very similar, very similar to the last one, right? Where we've got our pins, where our three colors of LED are connected. They're all outputs. I'll set the color to red to start with. And then in my loop, I'm going to just use this set color by hue function, which is going to take a value between zero and 360. Um, and that set color by hue function has three parts. Let's get that out of there. Um, it's basically going to say, uh, what part of our color wheel do we want to exist on? And by color wheel, I don't think I pulled a good graphic. Let's Google something together, shall we? Yes, let's. It's it's my stream and I say we're Googling something together. Um, if I want to say we are existing on our open image a new tab, um, I'm existing in a purely saturated world. These are all the colors I want. Rather than saying I want there's some red and some green and some blue, I would really just like to say where around this wheel do I want my color to lie? Where, starting from zero degrees, working our way all the way around a circle to 360 degrees, what color am I asking for? And that's what this set color by hue function is going to allow us to do. Um, and it's going to essentially say, um, at any given time, one of the three emitters should be off. Uh, blue or red or green should just be entirely off. Because if we have a little bit of all of the colors, we're sort of uh, working our way from less saturate toward toward a more pastel, a lighter tinted color, because if everything's all on, 
we're just looking at white light, right? So to be as saturated as possible, we really want to have one color off at any given time. And the other two colors we sort of want to choose, we want to have a nice mixing of the two of them in between their maximal values. So this set color by hue function is going to say, you know, if my input angle, which will be between zero and 360 degrees, is between zero and 120, let's say that's the portion where blue is just off. There's no blue here. Red is going to scale nice and cleanly from full down to zero as we advance from zero to 120 using this map function that you remember from a couple weeks ago. Um, and green is going to smoothly scale as we go from zero to 120 from, from zero to full. So once again, as this angle goes from zero to 120, red is going from full to zero, green is going from zero to full. So we have this nice crossfade between red and green in this range, right? And we're going to do a very similar thing in the other two possible ranges, right? This takes us only from the angle 0 to 120. If we're between 120 and 140 degrees, well, red just faded out to 0. Let's keep red off and we'll crossfade green to blue. And then when we go above 240, we'll crossfade from blue back to red. So we're sort of working our way around this curl wheel. Red fading out, green fading up, green fading out, blue fading up, blue fading out, red fading up. Um, that'll give us a nice, a nice smooth continuum of values to work with. And we can think of them just as a single angle around that color wheel. So if I upload this and I haven't screwed anything up, which is, you know, always possible. Mm. Kenneth mentioned in the chat a moment ago, um, red green LEDs that share both pins. We'll get to bicolor LEDs in just a little bit because they do function a little bit differently. Oop, an error occurred in my sketch. Oh no, can't open COM5. Oh, well, it's because it's COM11. Well, that would do it, huh? So we'll upload that, turn some lighting off, and we'll see that now we're sort of smoothly cycling through our possible range of colors, right? We are we're starting at full green, full red, full blue, and so on, all the way around in a circle. So when you're doing smooth fade effects and you want to keep things as saturated as possible, I find that thinking about things in this way, where you're thinking about your position all the way around a color wheel, um, is sort of more useful than thinking about R and G and B consistently every single time. Um, your experience may vary, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with controlling all the parameters one at a time. I just think this is a nice, a sort of a cleaner way to do it. And to sort of take it a step further, you know, when I said um, we're going to control this by hue, um, we're only thinking in a fully saturate world here. What if we want to think about things in not necessarily a fully saturate world? What if we want to have some desaturation where we get a little pastel -y, we mix in a little white? What if we don't want to be fully bright all the time, right? This code is based on the idea that I want my light to be as bright as possible. What if I don't necessarily want to be that bright? Well, another way of thinking about color, and this one I did actually pull a slide for in advance, in addition to thinking about um, things in terms of red, green, and blue values is this model of thinking about color in terms of hue, saturation, and value, where hue is your value, sort of as we were a moment ago, around the color wheel, right? Hue is the redness, the greenness, the blueness of your color. Saturation is the difference that your color lies away from pure white, right? So a very uh, saturate red is a pure, pure red. A desaturate red might be a pink, and uh, unsatur an entirely unsaturated red is just white. Any unsaturated color is just white. Um, you might go from a full greenish green to a paler green to a grayer green to just, a again, back to white. You can sort of see this little graph over on the side here where we have the fully saturated color wheel all the way around the outside of this comb. The, the outermost point is the most saturated point of this comb. As you move toward the center, we're adjusting the saturation. And then the third axis that we think of color along can be this value axis. And value just means brightness. Um, in terms of like thinking about colors of paint, value just means uh, lightness to darkness, black to white. For our purposes, it'll be uh, the amount of output that we're outputting. Now, of course, this, not to make this a, a stream about lighting theory, um, lightness and darkness, of course, is all relative. Who's to say that, um, you know, a very dim green LED is not fully green. It's just a dimmer green than a brighter green LED. So this value axis, we can think of sort of as a brightness axis for our purposes. Um, and there is, oops, spoilers, there is a way to translate between 
HSV, hue, saturation, value coordinates, and red, green, blue coordinates. And depending on your application, this may be a more natural way for you to think about color. What we were essentially doing a moment ago was saying, all right, value is going to be max, right, as bright as possible. Saturation is max, we're as saturated, we're as colorful as possible. And then just let that hue run in a big circle, right? But we can think about other ways to sort of move ourselves around this hue, saturation, and value space um, that aren't just running the hue around the color wheel. So let me introduce to you one more bit of code. This will be our uh, RGB HSV demo code from uh, from the website if you're playing along at home. Um, and it will be very straightforward. I think I've got some, some cropped up here. We'll define our output pins, red, green, and blue. We'll make them all output just like before. Um, and I'm going to make use of this set color by HSV function. Um, which I'll, I'll show you in just a moment here. And again, we're just going to run the hue value. You might guess this takes a hue, a saturation, and a value parameter. I'm going to run that hue around in a great big circle from 0 to 360 degrees. So in theory, this will look just like what we just looked at. The algorithm for converting hue, saturation, and value to RGB is a little bit complicated, and so I, I don't propose to walk us through every single step of it tonight. If you need it, I encourage you to go to the website and steal it from me, as I once stole it from somewhere else. Um, but essentially, you uh, much like before we had to choose which uh, third of our color wheel we were in to know which color should be turned off, in this case, we're going to be um, determining which sixth, which pie slice of our color wheel that we are in, in order to establish which color is going to be brightest or most dominant. Um, so we have this switch case statement here, which we haven't seen before, that we're using to um, to select the case where uh, to select which slice of pie we're in, sort of which area on the color wheel, uh, and based on that, we'll tell us, you know, which which of our three colors, our R, our G, and our B, is going to be our base value, which one's going to be scaled a little bit, and which one's going to sort of be dependent on the other two. Like I say, I, I don't plan to walk through all of this tonight, only know that we're using our HSV values to sort of calculate what red, green, and blue should be, and then we're going to set our RGB LED to that value. And again, I've just stolen this uh, this set, RG set LED color function from myself, um, just takes three numbers and sets the corresponding outputs to red, green, and blue sequentially. So let's update that code and we'll see what happens. Oops, can't open device. I must have had a different port open earlier because it's throwing an error every time I try to upload. Do some lighting adjustments and we'll see, much like before, we have our hue running around in a circle, but you might notice it's a little bit pastel-y and that's because in my loop here, I had my saturation set to 100 when its maximum value is 255. So if I max it out, we should see, I'll upload that again. Upload and run. Oops. Oh, sorry. This should be upload. Let's try that. I told you I'd break something at some point. There we go. So now our saturation is maxed out again. And now this, this runs around just like before, right? We're fully saturated. We're sort of moving through that entire wheel of hues that we can possibly show um, in our most saturated state. But let me uh, let me increase that saturation. Oh, let's say to, you know, decrease it to only 20% of what it was a moment ago. And you see we're moving through a much more pastel color space. And I actually think we are moving through some of an error color space. Something is not quite right here. Maybe the uh, maximum saturation is not as high as I think it can be. Well, I'll go back and I'll go back and debug that, and we can uh, I'll put up the updated version of the website in case you do end up stealing it. But you can sort of see how working in a uh, space of saturation and value and hue might be more natural for um, certain applications, especially really saturate ones, um, than working in an RGB color space. We'll get that back to running around nice and prettily for us. Questions so far? Questions on driving LEDs? Questions on common anode, common cathode? Questions on hue sat value? I'm going to roll up my sleeves here. It got warm here in Chicago today. It was like 70 degrees outside yesterday. It was beautiful today. It's supposed to get cold outside tomorrow. Oh, so I'm going to roll the sleeves up as I should have done ages ago. Hmm. As usual, while you're dropping questions, I'm just going to introduce the next topic, and I'll come right back to you in a second here. So, 
Um, Kenneth hinted at this a moment ago, but there is another kind of uh, multicolor LED in addition to our tricolor LED, um, which is a, or, or in addition to, I should say, our RGB LEDs, which are these bicolor LEDs, or at least I think of them as bicolor LEDs because they have two colors of LED in them. Um, very commonly, you'll see red and green. Um, you will sometimes see red and blue or blue and green. Um, red and green, I think, is common because it's a really nice indicator state. Um, you know, you might have a little, uh, you know, green glowing status LED that says, hey, everything's fine. And then you could turn it red when things catch on fire. Um, and as we just learned, if you turn on both red and green at the same time, you get sort of a yellowish color. So you have this sort of nice sense of like red, yellow, green trifecta of colors that could possibly indicate an error state. And from that, they often take the name, if you're buying them, of tricolor LED. I personally am going to continue to think of them as bicolor LEDs because they have two colors of LED in them. But if you see a tricolor LED that's marketed as, say, red, green, yellow, for example, um, that's what um, that's what they're referring to, is if you turn both the LEDs on at the same time, uh, then you make this third color that's available to you. Like, um, like uh, three color LEDs, they come in common anode and common cathode varieties. And you can do that same trick, in fact, that we did earlier with our bicolor LED to figure out which, uh, which species you have. And then you'd wire them up just like any other LED. You'd put a current limiting resistor in line with both of your uh, both of your LEDs, and you connect your common points to uh, either ground or five volt, depending on which species of LED you have. So let's take a quick look at that on the table. So I'm going to steal this circuit from my tricolor LED here. I am going to make use of a circuit I prepared earlier. Which I think it used this one. Let's see. Actually, in fact, we learned earlier that these were wired a little bit differently than I had wired them up. So let's unplug this and we'll rewire. We said the center one is our common cathode, our ground. So I'm gonna plug that into ground. I'm gonna plug, replug one of our signal wires into the opposite side here. I'm gonna move my wire from my Arduino and we'll plug that in. And I'm gonna load up one more bit of code. This will be the uh, bicolor step uh, bit of code from the website if you're following along at home. And I honestly, I don't know that we need to necessarily <laughs> go through it because it, it defines some pins, it turns them on and off. You're welcome to look at it if you want, but I hope you believe me when I say it, it is just a, it is digital writing to uh, to one pin and then both pins, then the other pin and then no pins. Um, so it's just gonna sequentially turn the two control pins that we have to our bicolor LED on and off. I might probably have to turn the lights off to see this and we'll see if I've guessed the right pins for it to do No, Red and green. We'll see if anything happens. Not a lot is happening, huh? What is that? Oh, because it's connected to the blue. I guessed wrong again. Go figure. Make sure that's connected correctly. Red is connected. Green is not connected. How strange. Let's try our other bicolor LED here. Our other bicolor LED here. Narrow. So you can see the green turning on there. For some reason, the red is not turning on. It's surely possible that I have this wired wrong. In fact, that's probably the most common possibility. Oh, here. Yes, I do. It helps if I plug the LED into the LED, or plug the resistor into the LED. There we go. I have red. Oh, and now red turns off. Something very strange is happening here. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's all, it's all going fine. It's all going super well tonight. You can tell I'm being a little bit more casual about the demo tonight because the last few weeks have just been so prep heavy. Um, but I hope you'll, I hope you'll agree with me that, uh, you can, I hope at this point you can wire up an LED or a pair of LEDs to a common circuit. I'm going to have them turn on. Since we had three colors work, I'm not going to feel too bad about not being able to slam in a, a two color LED here. Uh, it's all going great. Um, as Kenneth mentioned, there is sort of an interesting kind of um, bicolor LED that you will see out there, which is this um, these bicolor LEDs that only have two leads. Um, so if you pass current through them in one direction, one of the LEDs will turn on. If you pass current through them in another direction, the other LED will turn on. Um, 
These are, a, I won't be honest, a little bit of a pain to wire up. The places where you see them are sometimes where you, um, you could use them as indicators in places where you are reversing current already. You could imagine wiring one of these up in parallel to a DC motor that you were uh, controlling with an H bridge where your polarity was going to be swapping back and forth already. This could tell you, oh, for sure, this is rotating in the uh, red direction because current's flowing this way or in the green direction because current's flowing the other way. Um, as Kenneth points out, um, don't, don't forget your current limiting resistors. Yes. So you will need current limiting resistors, um, sort of on either side of this. Um, and I, I mentioned controlling, you know, using this in an H bridge indication circuit. If you wanted to drive these directly, an H bridge is actually not a bad way to do it. Um, you'll remember our H bridge circuit from a couple of weeks ago uses two PNP and two NPN transistors to selectively turn on current to flow through an object, either one way or the other way, depending on which pair of transistors you turn on. And one of the nice things about this arrangement is it allows you to have different current limiting resistors for each of your two colors. So look at me here. So let's say I want to turn my red LED on and my red LED has a small forward voltage. You remember forward voltage from a few weeks ago too. Um, so I want a 470 ohm current limiting resistor there. Let's say I work through my ohms law math and 470 is the perfect value, right? So I'm gonna put my 470 ohm resistor on say on this side by my PNP transistor because that 470 ohm resistor is only going to be in my current flow when the current is flowing from this PNP through the resistor, through red, through this NPN, down to ground, right? This 220 over here will be our current limiting resistor for our green LED, right? Because the, the red LED is never gonna see the current flowing through this 220. It's only going to be in play when we turn this PNP on, current's gonna flow through the 220 ohm, through the green LED and down to ground through this NPN. So you can select individual current limiting resistors for these bicolor LEDs in this case. You could, of course, you can select your, you know, different current limiting resistors for the different cathodes or different anodes of your common cathode or common anode multicolor LED as well. Like there's nothing stopping you. Um, on the table example here tonight, you know, all of mine happen to be the same, but there's no reason that they have to be. You could select them so that they were sort of better matched in brightness or current if you wanted to. This is actually, I will say, this is a circuit that I made use of myself just um, just a few months ago. We had a uh, uh, a exhibit at the place that I work at um, that needed some control. Um, and we had a a little. Um, piece of e-textile that was going to heat up and be interacted with by guests. And uh, we had a re basically a button to turn on a relay um, that would turn on power to it for a little while. And because it got very, very hot, uh, it would uh, we wanted it to be able to turn off again on its own on a specific amount of time. So we used a, a timer relay for that purpose, right? Which is a very nice circuit in that you turn it on and after a set amount of time that you configure, it turns itself off again. Super good function. But we also wanted to have some indication for the guests of when they could press the button again and it would do something. So we had a little metal button that had a little LED ring built into it that had one of these bicolor LEDs built into it. And so uh, the, get, the button would be big and green and inviting when you could press it, you'd come up, you'd press it. And then an H bridge circuit inside the control box that I built would turn that LED from green by a current in one direction to red current in the other direction. And guests pretty much understood like, oh, red button, I'm not gonna press the red button. And after say 30 seconds, it would turn off and the button would turn green again saying, hey, press me again, it's time to go. So um, a useful circuit, um, a lot of sort of industrial controls that have LED indicators built in make use of these, um, these bi-directional bi-color LEDs for some reason. Um, Brian says, you could also do a couple of relays. You certainly could. Yeah, you could do um, two relays. You could do a double pull, double throw relay that like that reverses um, the voltage uh, and current flowing through your LED as well. And H-bridge is definitely not the only way to do it. It's just a, just one possibility. Kenneth says he'll often drive these directly between two digital output pins. Yeah, for sure. Um, you could use one digital pin to source current and one to sync current and then reverse those two. I think in that situation, you give up the ability to have different current limiting resistors um, since you would sort of only have one one continuous circuit, but that's, that's totally viable. Mm. And Kenneth points out that those indicators are not great for the colorblind. It is true. Um, yeah, no excuse. <laughs> the colorblind folks are, will have a hard time with a red green, uh, red green display. That is certainly true. Um, that is the gist of multicolor LEDs. I can't believe we've gone through our first topic and we're only 45 minutes into the night. That's got to be some kind of record for us. <laughs> um, we are going to come back to it later and integrate it with the LCD work that we're going to do later in the night. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty straightforward. Feel free to continue asking, uh, 
asking questions about those um, or other possibilities or LED tape because um, it'll take me just a second here to set up for our um, our LCD screen demo. Will it? Is that true? No, no, it's not. It's the next slide. Oh, past Jeff did me real solid. Okay, let's just jump to LCD screens. Keep dropping questions in the chat. We'll get them in a second here. So LCD screens. I'm, I'm trying really hard to call them LCD screens and not LCD displays because LCD, as Kenneth pointed out last week, it stands for liquid crystal display. So an LCD display is an LCD display display. Um, they come in many flavors, but if, you, if you've never seen them before, this is the gist of what they look like. Um, the kind of display that we're talking about tonight is one um, that has uh, a set number of characters across it, and each character is made up of a, a sequence of dots in rows and columns, um, typically five dots across and either eight or ten dots tall. Sometimes you see these called a dot matrix LCD character display. And the character is important there because we don't have total freedom to sort of draw whatever we want to on these displays. We're going to make use of the fact that stored in the hardware built into the display itself are the common characters that we would use. You know, in the case of this little drawing over here, the, the display itself is storing the pixels that make up an capital H, lowercase e, lowercase l, and so on. And we're just telling it, hey, please put in a capital H, then put in a lowercase e, and so on and so on. There is some ability to divide your own characters, and we'll get into that later tonight as well. Um, but if you're looking at, um, at purchasing a display, these are often called character displays, um, and the sort of freeform ones will often be called graphical displays. Now, those two terms are fairly abused, especially on Amazon, but that should be a pretty good place to look. You can also see, if you can't see here, you'll see in my table in a little bit, you can often sort of make out the individual boxes of each letter. Um, that's a good a good clue that you're working with a character display and not a graphical display. Um, one one more thing to look at would be the, the integrated circuit, the chip that drives 99% of these and certainly all the compatible code that we're working with tonight is called the H44780. It's a very, very common IC. We'll look at its data sheet in a little bit as we get in sort of into the details. But if you're like, oh, I'm not quite sure if this display is the kind I'm looking for, H44780 is that's a, a sure sign that this is the kind we're working with. They come in various sizes. Um, the sort of largest that you see or see floating around is this four line by 20 characters across form factor that I have on the left here. What I'm gonna play with tonight um, is this two by 16 form factor. All the code is readily interchangeable between the two. And in fact, if you're thinking about getting one of these to play with, this is kind of a neat product that's, that's uh, been put out by Adafruit, who we've talked about as the electronics supplier before. Um, it's a shield, right? So it's a circuit board that snaps right to the top of your Arduino Uno that has one of these character displays and some buttons built into the bottom of it here. Just because honestly, if you're if you're doing a project like this, often you're going to want a little bit of output and a little bit of input. So they made this nice sort of, it's got an LCD, it's got some buttons on it. Um, you can use it to sort of make a, a, a basic application. So that's kind of a neat thing to look out for. Um, we talked about not looking for graphical displays. The other thing you know, that, that we are not talking about tonight, although they're super cool and worth looking at, is these OLED displays. Um, they, they function somewhat differently than what we're looking at tonight. So if you're going out after tonight and buying some of these, you want to stay away from the OLED displays if you're looking to replicate what we're going to do. If you are looking to buy some of these, there are links in the description of this stream or this video um, to both styles, both the sort of basic display and the display from Adafruit with buttons. So feel free to check those out in the description below. So, um, let me show you what one of these things looks like on, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll have a fun time looking at how we actually wire them up. So, let me get this out of here and get my other pre-wired Arduino back. So, this is the 16 by 2, the 16 character by 2 line LCD display that I'll be playing with tonight. Um, as I was digging through my junk bin to play with things, I have a whole bunch of these. They come in all kinds of different form factors. Um, all kinds of different end connectors. You know, this is two rows of 16 pins. Got one here that's got some pins hanging off the side. This guy with the pins hanging off the side is really nice for wiring into a breadboard because you can just sort of chunk that right down. I had to do some crimes to these pins to get them to fit into my breadboard. Um, so if you're looking to buy one, I, I would recommend finding ones either in the shield form factor that snaps the top of your Arduino or one with a single row of pins like this that just chunks into a breadboard there. But for tonight, this is the one that I will be playing with. So let me plug that in. 
And I'll tell you what, let's run a little bit of code on it. And then we'll come back to how you wire these things in. You can see I'm running that, that loading code from earlier on this display right now. Um, this will be, if you're playing along on the website, this will be our um, LCD Hello World code. And it's basically the Hello World code from the Arduino IDE. You remember, if you've done it a few times now, if you come to your file menu, go to examples, you'll find all, uh, you find some examples in the liquid crystal uh, library examples page. This is basically their Hello World sketch, but I've changed the pins to be uh, what I've actually plugged in. So we'll get to the code in a second here, but I just want to show you what this thing looks like so we sort of have a basis of conversation for when we're talking about this stuff. Let's see. Michael says, we make it to 90, we make 90 minutes? I, I sort of doubt we'll make it under 90 minutes. We, we haven't yet. Why start now? Um, HD 44780 supports up to 80 characters, says Kenneth. So you should typically see 4 by 20 or 2 by 40. Yeah. Um, so uh, interestingly, internally on these, each line is always 40 characters long. So if you try and write past the first character, you just end up sort of in space for a while um, because it will let you write 40 characters even if it doesn't have 40 characters to display. So this is the basic look of an LCD display. You can see, I think if I, I turn the lighting down here, a little hard to see. Um, you can see the individual characters making up my display, and my lowercase h, my lowercase e, l, l, o, comma, and so on. And then I have this number down here, which is simply counting up by seconds. And you sort of see this regular spacing of letters, right? We're always going to be filling the same, in my case, five by eight pixel block with a singular letter or character. Um, we don't have the ability to um, uh, to sort of space the letters wherever we want to. We're constrained to these sort of five by eight pixel blocks um, by the display itself. Okay, it says drink every time Jeff says <laughs> LCD display. I, I, I will as well, because I'm sure that will only help. So that's the basic look of an LCD display. Let's see how you wire it up and get to this point. So um, looking through our code here, um, all everything above this in the code is some comments. So let's get down to the, the meat of the thing. We're going to use this include statement to include our liquid crystal library. We looked at including libraries just a few weeks back. You'll remember if you come up to the sketch menu, come down to include library, it will let you select the liquid crystal library as a place to start. Um, the liquid crystal library is included with the Arduino IDE at every installation. Um, so you don't need to install it from anywhere. It's already there for you. Um, then we're going to use this constructor to say, I want to make an object called LCD with the following parameters. Um, and it's going to be the pins that you hook up to various places on the display in the following order. In my case, I did pins 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And we'll look at those connections on a circuit um, in just a second here. Um, but the, the gist of this code is really simple. In your setup function, you need to call this lcd.begin function. And in it, you tell it how many columns and how many rows of characters you have. In my case, I have 16 characters in a line and I have two lines. So this is where you tell it that that's the case. And then you can uh, just start printing text to us. You remember like we printed text to the serial, uh, the serial console just a little while ago? we can use this lcd.print statement to send a string like hello world to the display. Now by default, when you start up the display, it's going to position itself in the top left-hand corner uh, and then write each successive character one character to the right, which is pretty much what we want, right? Oops. <laughs> we reset that there. Oof, that's some, that's some deep crimes. So I started with my my, uh, my position in my upper left hand corner here and printed an H, then it moved one character over for me and printed an E, then one character over and printed an L, and so on and so on. And it will gladly just sort of auto increment through the positions on your display for you. But you can also take manual control of where it's printing the next character by using this command, the set cursor command. And in this case, uh, it takes uh, two values, the column and the row that you want to put your cursor at where the next character will be printed. So in the loop of the example we're looking at on the table, what I'm doing is setting the cursor to column zero, the, the very beginning of a line, in row one. And you'll remember that uh, that arrays that we looked at last week are indexed from zero. The first position is position zero. Same thing with these, uh, these LCD screens. Um, the first row, the top row, is row zero, then row one, and if you have them, row two and row three after that. So here, I'm going to the very left of my first line, and I'm uh, very very left of the line, and I'm going to line number one, which in this case is the second row. 
once I'm at that position, I can print things to that position. And in this case, I'm printing not text, but just a number, and it will gladly print numbers for you. In this case, I'm taking my millis function, which is the number of milliseconds since we've started our program, and dividing it by a thousand. So in other words, I get the number of seconds since our program has started. And so that's what this is counting over here. So every single time I go through that loop, it's going to set the cursor back to the first position on that line, and then I'm going to print the current time. Then it's going to set the cursor back to the first position on that line and print the current time again. But I, I want to be clear that it is just setting a cursor and printing over what is there is not in any way clearing what was there before. And so let me show you um, one, one way you can get yourself into trouble with just sort of um, willy-nilly moving the cursor around and not thinking about what's underneath you. Let me, um, let me do something else in my setup code here. Let me get rid of the table there. Um, let's say I'm going to print hello world on the first line. Then I'm going to lcd.setCursor. Uh, let's move it to that first position in the second line as well, and we'll print a hello world there as well. And then I'm going to make it wait three seconds just so we can set a couple things up. So we'll reset. We've printed hello world on both lines. And then when we get to our loop function, we just move to the first position on that second line and start printing our numbers. But you'll notice we can still have hello world. And once we get to 10, we have low world. And once we get to 100, we'll have low world, right? There's nothing going on in my code that's telling any of those other positions to change. I'm just using that print statement that prints those seconds to write to the first however many positions it takes to print that number. I'm not clearing anything else. So if you're working especially with numbers that change their length, that change from, say, 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000 of something, you want to make sure you're thinking about how am I clearing out any unused positions if that's something you're interested in doing. Just a fair warning. Cool. So that's that is the 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 gist of writing to an LCD screen. You're going to set a position for your cursor, and then you're going to print a number of characters to that position. So let's take a quick look at how you'd actually get the thing wired up so that it would uh, start responding to you, and then we'll get into fancier stuff that you can do with these displays. So we'll do our wiring in two fart two, two farts here. <laughs> My gosh, L LCD displays. <laughs> um, we'll do our wiring in two parts here. Um, this first diagram is just the power for the LCD screen. So you can see here, we've hooked up our Arduino Uno's 5 volt and ground lines, the, the power and ground lines of our breadboard here. Um, we've hooked power and ground up to pins 1 and 2, ground to pin 1, power to pin 2, and power in this case is typically 5 volts. Almost all these screens that I've seen run at 5 volts. So we've hooked that up to uh, pins 1 and 2 here. Um, we've also hooked power and ground up plus 5 volts and ground to pins 15 and 16, which are on boards that have 16 pins, just power for the backlight. Um, there is typically an LED module that lives underneath the LCD itself that provides some light shining through the back of it so you can see what's going on on the screen. If you remember playing with an old Game Boy, right, that didn't have, an old Game Boy that didn't have a backlight, that you couldn't see in the direct sunlight, um, you often need some kind of light passing through the LCD to actually see what's changing on it. So most of these have an LED built in behind them. Uh, on my display here, I actually only have 14 control pins on this side. And then I have two extra pins over here labeled A and K that are the anode and cathode connections for my LED. Mine had a current limiting resistor built into this board. Many, if not most boards do not. So I would recommend putting a current limiting resistor in place to limit these to say 100 milliamps. If you buy these from a reputable supplier like Adafruit, it will tell you how to do the current limiting. This one happened to have current limiting built in. Um, so you can see if I, let's see, let me unplug some of the backlight here. Just unplug that from the breadboard and plug the thing back in. Oops, it's freaking out now. You can see how hard it is to see anything going on on that display, even if I shield it. There's just not a lot of light passing through the thing. But if I plug the blacklight power back in, now we're really seeing things clearly. So giving power to that backlight, super good for visibility. So that's the power side of wiring these things up. We also have this potentiometer hanging out here. This is a little graphical potentiometer that's hooked up on, on both sides to power and ground, plus five volts and ground. And its middle pin, the wiper pin, is connected to pin three of the LCD module. Pin three is your contrast adjustment, um, and it, it's what allows you to sensibly adjust the contrast on your display. So I zoom out just a little bit here. Um, a lot of times if you were doing this sort of for an installation, I would use a quite small potentiometer because you're not going to be passing much current through it. But in my case, I've whacked in a quite big potentiometer so you can see what's going on. Let's see. Reset that. Oh, I was afraid this would happen. I've squidged something up. 
oh, here, the contrast pin probably come out. Yeah. So my wiring has come loose underneath my display here. This is part of the problem. You can see I actually had to, I don't want to push it up and show you, but you can see I've had to mangle those print pins pretty badly to get them to slot into my breadboard here. So if I were you, I would just buy a display that has uh, has the appropriate pinage. Let's see. There we go. So you can see if I move this into eye shot here, if I turn this contrast pot just a little, we'll see those letters go away. There's a really fine range um, where things actually are visible. Um, so I usually just set this once and then leave it alone. It's a good advantage for using a small potentiometer. You're less likely to, uh, to knock it accidentally, but it is important that you hook up your contrast pin. Otherwise, uh, you may discover that you see nothing. And this actually brings me back to a point that, uh, that Mike was alluding to earlier. If, um, these modules can be finicky and they have the unfortunate property that even if one wire is not fully connected um, you it's strange and sort of indecipherable things may happen so if you're having problems with your module do not fret they are often fiddly um, check your contrast connection check your power connection and check all your data connections um, i know mike did ultimately get his working which was pretty cool um, so that's your contrast connection and those are all of your power connections to your lcd module your data connections are really quite simple. Um, in the most basic mode, you only need six digital pins to control your LCD module. Um, you can pick whichever six digital pins you like. I've chosen eight through 13, but you could choose whichever, um, especially if you were gonna make use of some other pins for say, pulse with modulation, you might wanna leave those pins free or you know, make an intelligent choice that way. Um, in this wiring diagram, you can see we've used pins two, three, four, five, uh, 11, and 12, and here are the connections that you're making. Um, you're gonna hook up one digital pin to pin four of your LCD module. Um, that's going to be your register select pin, I think the RS means there. And E, pin six, is also going to be hooked up to a digital pin. The pin six of your LCD module hooked up to a digital pin of your Arduino, that's your enable pin. That pin will toggle to let the, uh, the LCD module know that it's time to accept data from your device. You might notice we skipped over pin five. Pin five configures the LCD module for reading or writing. So not only can you send data to the display to be shown, you can actually ask for information back from your display as well. In our case, we're not going to make use of that functionality as sort of some limited use cases where you would actually do that. So we're just gonna go ahead and tie that read write pin, that fifth pin just straight to ground, right? And then we're going to hook up uh, pins uh, 11, 12, 13, and 14 to any digital pins of our choosing. Um, if you're looking at a wiring diagram, those are pins DB4, 5, 6, and 7. And you might be thinking, what about pins DB0, 1, 2, and 3? Well, these LCD modules have the nice property of you can either hook eight data lines into them and feed them eight, eight bytes of data at a time, or you can hook four data lines into them and hand them four bits of data twice for every command and they will just happily accept that from you. Um, since often we're in the case with these low cost microcontrollers of trying to conserve input and output pins, I almost always control these in um, in four, four bit control mode, um, but you can do them in eight bit control mode if speed is a real concern for you, or if you just happen to have plenty of output pins, um, they will both work the same. And then you can see over on the side here, we've hooked up our uh, LED plus and minus to five volts and ground as well. So back on the table here, you'll see I have my I have my various fly wires going from the digital pins of my Arduino back over to my display. Reset that. There we go. And back to our hello world getting overwritten, uh, overwritten on our display there. So that's just of wiring these up. And like I say, um, oh, Mike says that his breadboard had a bad power rail. Yeah, that will certainly prevent things from working particularly well. Uh, Chris said LCD display. So everyone, everyone out there who's drinking can drink. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's that's the gist of getting these wired up. Let's look at some um, let's look at some fun things that you can do with them. Um, so you know, counting up is all well and good, um, but what I typically will use these for is if I just need a little local display of some parameter or variable or sensor reading or something like that. So um, let me open up a piece of code for you here. This will be if you're following along at home. This will be the LCD. Uh, what did I call this? LCD mock interface example. If you're playing along at home, all code on the website, jeff.clash, that's electronics bash. Um, let me upload this. We'll take a look at it on the table and then we'll walk through it all together. We'll let that upload. 
I'm going to zoom back into my display here because what's going on with the wiring is not the most interesting part of tonight. So this is the kind of um, kind of thing I would use these little displays for, right? I have, um, let's say I have a remote motor controller that's far from um, my head end and I just want, I want the whoever's operating it there to be able to see at a glance some critical parameters of what's going on with my physical device. Um, so you can see here I've, I've labeled it, I've said, hey, motor one has an RPM value and my temperature sensor is giving me an error. And then my end user could take some action based on that. Um, so this, this is the kind of thing that these things are really useful for is, right? I could just, you know, lay this information in and I don't have to go and hook up a serial console or try and do something over the network to get this information. I've just given my end user the the ability to see some data. So let's look at how we build this simple display and then we'll build some more intense ones on top of it. So like before, um, I am initializing my liquid crystal, I'm including my liquid crystal library. I'm uh, defining the pins that my display is connected to um, and I'm creating this LCD object using those various values. Um, I am going to do my lcd.begin command, which takes a number of columns, a number of rows. I'm going to make things random in this example. So I'm using this random seed function that you remember from recently that uh, makes sure that the random functions that we're calling later that generate random numbers are truly generating random numbers and are just repeating what looks like a random sequence every time you run the code. Uh, and then I'm gonna make use of some functions that I've written that we'll look at in a second here called draw full interface and draw RPM that are going to be drawing things to the screen. So uh, in I'm going to only call draw full interface once in my setup function. And all it's going to do is create that label I call motor one at position zero, zero. So that's the top left corner, all the way to the left on the zeroth row, the zeroth line. So that's what's going to create this motor one label here. And as long as I'm careful about never overwriting that label, I never have to draw it again. It's, it's wasteful to do so. So I'm just gonna leave that be. I'm gonna only update the data that I need to update later on. So uh, inside drawful interface, I'm also going to draw RPM and draw temperature as well. Um, draw temperature is really easy. I've made it so the temperature sensor in this mock-up display always has an error. So draw temperature just sets the cursor to uh, column eight in line one, which remember in our case is the second line, prints the temperature and prints the error. Of course, if you had a real temperature sensor on here, you could have this printing the actual value of your temperature sensor. But in our case, I'm printing an error state. Um, and I'm going to draw the RPM. Um, the... Uh, the draw RPM function looks very similar. It's going to set the cursor to the leftmost position of that second line, line number one. Um, it's going to deliberately print this string of nothingness here. And this is because our RPM value is going to change, as we'll see in a second, between being one digits, two digits, three digits. And I always wanna make sure that I'm clearing out the space that it exists in uh, before I write the new value in. So I'm just gonna write a string of three blank spaces in to begin with as a way to clear that out. Um, then I'm going to set that cursor back to the very left side of that first line. I'm going to print my label RPM and a space, and then I'm going to print the value of our RPM variable. Um, and that is going to give me this RPM label here and whatever the value of that RPM variable is going to exist here. And you can see, I think what's happened here is at some point the RPM variable became uh, four digits and left this four hanging out here. Um, because I, I only put three spaces in and not four. I think that four is a leftover, which is not a desirable function. So if I add a fourth, a fourth space into this print function here and overwrite that, I think that will actually clean things up quite a bit. Yeah, so now we can see that RPM value changing in real time. And in our case, I have, again, as I faked the temperature sensor error, I have faked the RPM error. Um, I've said if, if or the, you know, the RPM value, if millis mod 50 is equal to zero, right? When the, when the number of milliseconds since the program has started is divisible by 50, I'm going to add a random number between minus three and three to the RPM value. And then when it has changed by some threshold, I'm going to uh, update uh, the, the RPM value to display it to the screen. Um, so the RPM is not coming from a, an RPM sensor that I'm using. I'm faking it for the sake of this example because this is not speed sensor night. This is LCD night. Is the fourth digit because the RPM is going negative? Could certainly be, right? Because it's automatically adding that little negative sign in front of the number. I'm realizing I have nothing that's actually constraining the RPM to only be three digits. It just seems to, to only be three digits. Um, but the way that it's sort of want, doing this random walk around zero where it's incrementing by plus or minus one, two, or three each time should keep it to be a, a near zero value, I would think. 
Um, but now that we've added the, that fourth space into that sort of clearing section, that, that LCD that print and four spaces, that should now be clearing out that full space. If we went to five digits, we'd be in trouble because we'd start overwriting the rest of our labels. So when you're thinking about laying out these interfaces, it is important to think about like how big could this number actually be? And if it's bigger than the space I have available, do I need to get creative about how I display it? Um, we'll see an example, um, not, not big spoilers, but the, one of the later things I want to do tonight is share with you a project that I have sitting right over here on my workbench that I built using an LCD display a few years ago and how I handled the fact that it had to handle numbers in the ones, the thousands, and the millions um, in a sort of clean way. So um, that's sort of a, a gist of how you might think about laying out a, a very basic um, LCD screen display, um, writing whatever labels you want once, and then when your variables change value, printing those values to the screen. Questions? LCD display. My goodness. You might as well just settle in. I might as well have just called this, did I, 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 did I, I think I called this stream text displays. I might as well have just called it LCD display displays and multicolor LED display displays. Mm. LCD displays and LED diodes. Nailed it. Uh, that's great. Um, ask the questions if you got them. We're going to keep building some interesting stuff. So um, you, you can get as clever as you want with how you write characters to this screen, how you write text there and various things. Um, there is a standard, I think I mentioned earlier that this is built around a standard set of characters. It knows the pixels that are, should be in a capital M, a lowercase o, a lowercase t, and so on. And basically what we're doing with our code um, is asking it to write a capital M, a lowercase o, a lowercase t, and it will create those pixels for us. Yeah, Chris, I agree. Something is still, something may still be strange. It may also be, Chris, looking strange because I have, oh, because I have a, oh, yes, I need a fifth space to see if something accurate to look at while I, while I uh, ramble here. Um, so while we have this standard set of characters, we can also make our own limited set of custom characters. So let's take a look first at the built-in characters that we have available to us. So I think I pulled these earlier. Yeah. So this may not be super duper clear. Well, that's a pretty good representation. We can pull up the data student set and zoom in on some of these. Um, but um, when these standard driver chips, these H44780 chips are manufactured, they are almost always manufactured in one of these two variants um, called ROM A00 and ROM A02. Um, and what these are are standard character se um, standard character sets that are built into the device. And this is how we ask it which character we would like it to display. Um, so to read this chart, it might be a little bit hard. So actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will pull up the data sheet so that we can zoom in closer on one of these charts. I think that will be a useful thing. Let me get rid of the table there. And we will find our character sets. Here we go. Yeah, so this is the same the same charts we were just looking at. I'm just gonna I want to be able to to zoom in so we can actually see what's going on here. So um, you can see this chart is called the correspondence between character codes and character patterns for ROM A00. And spoilers, that's the ROM I have available. I'll show you in just a little bit how to figure out which ROM you have available if you're ever not sure. So you can see uh, what we're what we're showing here. This chart is showing us the lower four bits and the upper four bits uh, of the byte that we are sending to the LCD to ask it to display a specific pattern. So here's how you read this chart. Um, these you can see this this the rows here are labeled X, 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 and then four digits. And the columns here are labeled with just four digits. So this position here, which is the numeral zero, corresponds to sending the code to the LCD of 00110000. We take these four digits to the top here, we lay them in where these four X's are here, and that's our full number. So to send this Q character to the device, we would send 0101. To send, scrolling down to a random place, to send this colon here, well, it's in column 0011, and it's in row 1010. So we would send 0011, 1010. Now, thankfully, using the 
print statement on our LCD object that we defined earlier, it does all of this code translation for you. You'll see that I didn't have to say, you know, oh, uh, what is a capital R? Well, I could look it up in my chart and, oh, that's uh, 101000001. I'll send that. No, it just uh, has all of these codes built into this library. Um, so you can just send, in your code, you can spell out text strings like this, and all of this byte information is taken care of for you in the background for standard English characters that you might want to use. And you can see there's a lot of sort of useful standard English characters in here. I have uppercase letters, lowercase letters, uh, pound, ampersand, percentage sign, basic math operators, basic arrows, and various things. Um, we also have the yen operator in here, and that might be a clue uh, to the fact that there are other characters besides just the basic English alphabet also stored in ROM A00. Um, we have uh, a lot of Japanese characters, we have some uh, some German characters, we have some uh, characters from the Roman alphabet with diacritics, we have a few assorted characters in here, um, we have X bar, we have pi, we have sigma and omicron. Um, and for these characters, the easiest way to display them on the screen, because I, I'm, I'll be honest, I don't know how to type this particular character. In fact, let's, let's find one that's, that's recognizable and we can write it together. Ah, here's a nice block character. Let's say I want to print it to the screen. Well, since I don't have a block key on my keyboard, I would probably need to ask for this to be printed by using its byte code. So let's look that up and we'll do it together. So this block character here, that is going to be character 1101011. So 1101011. You don't have to memorize that. I think I've got it. So to print the non-English character to the device, here, let's start a new file here. This will be a uh, a piece of code that's not on the website, my apologies, but I'm just gonna do a simple demo for us here. I'm gonna blow up my loop code and in my setup function here, I'm going to say uh, lcd.setCursor, let's set it to the top left corner, lcd.print, create a byte with a value. Oh, what was it again? It was 11011011. 11011011. And again, we've prefaced this byte value, this sort of binary value, with this capital B here. So it interprets this as a binary value, a value made up of only ones and zeros, as opposed to being, uh, you know, 11,011,011. Uh, 11, right? You put that B in there to make it so. And then we, we, can, we explicitly, or I like to explicitly cast it to a byte value so that we're sure it's interpreted in the right way. So. If I upload that to the device, and uh, and I haven't made any mistakes, it's also possible, I don't know if this auto clears. Oops, I've got 219 over here. Why is that? Oh, maybe, I, maybe I've maybe i done this too many, maybe I don't need to do the B and cast it to a byte. Is that true? I definitely have a working example of this that I can pull up here in a second here, but we'll see. Oh, <laughs> I know what it is. I know what it is. Kenneth may have uh, Kenneth may have pulled it already. We'll see. Mm. What I've done is I've mistakenly used the print command here. The print command tries its best to interpret what you have written as something that you would print to a piece of paper as a number, as a string of text. When you're writing something more literal, like, hey, I want you to reference the value in your internal memory that corresponds to this value, the print statement is actually the wrong one to use. You want to use the write statement. And so hopefully, if I haven't screwed this up again, we'll see, there we go. So we come back to the table. We now see we have our little square character corresponding to that position in the table on the first position of our LCD there. And we could do the same for any any position in this chart, right? We could say, oh, I want to put an, uh, what do I want to put there? I want to put a right facing arrow uh, in that display. Um, so that's going to be 0111, 1110. So B, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Upload that, come back to the table, and we'll see, we place a, uh, put a right facing arrow there as well. We can do this exact same thing with literal characters, the letters of the Roman alphabet or you know punctuation symbols, um, but we can also interact with those as uh, in this bytes method using the write method if we want to. Sort of depends what you're doing um, with your display. If you're making a simple interface, I think the print statement is usually easier because you can just write your text to your screen. Um, but um, you might want to um, interact with your your letters or your digits through code in a way that's easier to use the write function. Now let me let me show you an example of that. Um, I'm going to load up a piece of code now. 
you're following along at home, this is the LCD character sets demo from the website. Um, this is a, a way, I, I promised you a way earlier, to tell which ROM you have in your display if you're not entirely sure. Um, so what this piece of code is going to do is basically uh, display every character uh, that our display can, and that will sort of let us identify which bit of, of uh, which ROM our, our display has built into it. So just to step you quickly through this code, because I think it's interesting, we're going to do the same things we've done before. We're including our Liquid Crystal library. Get that out of the way. Um, we are initializing our LCD object. And by the way, this object called LCD could be called party pants for whatever we want. It's just an object name. It's a variable name. Calling it LCD though is, is pretty handy. If you had multiple LCDs hooked up to the same Arduino, maybe you'd want to get more inventive with your naming, but for our purposes, LCD is a, a pretty handy name. In my setup function, I'm going to call LCD.begin, right? As we have been before. And then I'm going to go through this loop that's going to, I'll, I'll breeze through this a little bit because the point is controlling the LCD display and not getting into the depth of code like we have the past few weeks. But um, just at a glance, you can tell we're going to be looping from zero to 256 in steps of 16. Right? We're gonna jump ahead by 16 every time we go through this loop. And every time we do, we're gonna draw 16 characters to the screen uh, and label them so we can tell which character is which so we can start to decipher which ROM we have. Um, and the way we're gonna do that is going to, uh, on the first first line, print the point in our loop that we're at, and on our second line here, print a value that's eight more than that. It's going to give you, uh, you know, where we are in the loop and where are we halfway to our next step. And then we are going to write a series of bytes. We're going to write eight bytes to the top line and write the next eight bytes to the bottom line, right? So in this loop, I'm using this write command for wherever we are in our main loop, plus zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, to write the next eight bytes in our sequence. And then on the next line, on line one here, I'm going to write the eight bytes that follow that. I'm going to write where we are in our loop, plus zero, plus one, plus two, and then eight beyond that. Uh, then I'm going to wait two seconds and I'm going to move through that loop again. So we're going to see all of the characters that our, our display can, can output uh, in steps of 16, waiting two seconds each time. So let's make sure we're on the right port. We are. We'll upload that. We'll come back to the table. <laughs> LCD display. Oh, I, I've just lost track at this point. All right, so now we can see we're stepping through our character sets uh, 16 at a time. This is the, the number of the first character of the display and the, char the, the character number of the first character in this second line here. You can see we're just moving through our English alphabet there. We have a, a, a number of non-printing characters in the middle of this RAM that don't do anything. And then we move into the second half of our ROM, and you can see all of these other, um, primarily Japanese, but other diacritic or Cyrillic or German characters that we might choose to use. So this is a pretty good indication that we are, in fact, in uh, ROM A00 in our case. If you were seeing uh, ROM A22, you would be seeing characters like uh, a bunch more diacritics, much more accented characters, a um, bunch more accented vowels and various things. You also get a heart symbol and various other cute things in ROM, uh, ROM O2. But... Like I say, most of the time in the States, when you pick one up, like when I picked up one at a flea market, um, it came with ROM A00 and most of them seem to. So feel free to use this piece of code. This is the LCD character sets piece of code if you're not quite sure um, what what ROM your uh, display has. Or honestly, if you just want like a quick tour through like, hey, what characters can my, uh, can my display make? This might be a sort of a fun way to step through that. So we started talking about um, the built-in characters, which are all well and good and very useful. And you can see how these might contribute to making a more clear or functional display, right? Um, going back to our motor display example earlier, maybe it would be made more clear if it had, instead of positive and negative numbers, what if it uh, did just the base RPM and then had a little arrow on the display for which direction the motor was spinning from the user's viewpoint. That might be a useful thing to have. Um, if we're using this to measure something for a multimeter, maybe the ohm symbol is useful um, or the dollar sign for for displays um chris i said i just see the first of characters is how the loading bar is done ah chris you're getting chris you love to get ahead of me and i love it too because you're always spurring us on to the next thing and i think it's great um yes the loading bar is hidden for the moment in that first set of characters which i have loaded as a set of custom characters um this is a way of making the display do some things that uh, lie outside the bounds of its normal characters. And here is how that works. Let's load up uh, a new piece of code here. This will be the LCD custom char intro bit of code if you're playing along online. 
so let's get into how this works. This is, this is not the loading bar bit of code yet. We're going to walk before we can run, but we will get there. So here's how this code works. Um, like every other bit of code, we are including our liquid crystal library. We are defining which pins we're attached to. We initialize our LCD object. The data for custom characters needs to be stored in a specific format, which is as an array of eight bytes uh, I, uh, bytes in quotes of five bits each with a zero being off and a one being on. So this is an example that is literally just stolen from the examples folder in your Arduino IDE. Uh, I think it is called, what is it called here? Custom character. And they've included some data for us. Um, you might take from the variable name suggestion heart that this is going to be a heart character. And here's how they've encoded it. You can see the top line will be blank. Then we have our two, uh, two of our five dots on in our next line. And all on, all on, all on. Then we narrow down to the point of our hardware at the bottom and the bottom row will be off. This is when I'm defining custom characters, this is a really easy way to do it in your Arduino IDE because you can sort of graphically draw your shape in this format here um, using zeros to be off and ones to be on. They've included a few other characters here, and we'll run this code in a second, see this adorable characters as well. Um, this smiley character, you can sort of make out if you squint here, right? I've got my, let me zoom in even more. I've got my ones up here for my eyes, and I have my little smiley mouth down here at the bottom. So by laying out your data in this way, kind of Palmer in the same way you were asking about last week, I did have to, you know, you do have to manually format your data in this way, but it makes it really easy to see what your character is going to look like. Um, so it's a, a really handy thing to do. And they have some other characters down here to do a few other things. So here's how you make use of that data to write custom characters to your display. Um, we're going to, in our setup function, do LCD that to begin with our number of columns and number of rows, like before. And then we're going to use this new command, uh, create char. In the standard displays, you typically will get eight possible characters that you can make. Um, indexed 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And this create char command says, hey, take the data that's stored in the second parameter here in my heart array and use that data to make a character at position hero, uh, position 0. Take the smiley data and make that the data for the character at position 1, and so on and so on. And then we can use that data by referencing it as a byte the same way we were referencing any of those custom characters a moment ago. So down here in the rest of our setup function, you can see how we're going to use it. Um, I'm going to print I and the space. I'm going to write a byte with just zeros in it. So this is the same as zero, 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 zero. Right? And we remember that byte zero is what we ask our new custom heart character to be. So I'm going to get I, a heart, Arduino, and then I'm going to write a byte with a character one in it. And character one is this smiley face that we defined earlier. So when I upload this, the first line of our code should have I, heart, Arduino, and a smiley face. Let's come to the table, see if that worked. There we go, I, heart, Arduino, and a smiley face. And you can see we've defined a couple other little uh, custom characters there for a little man with his arms down and his arms up, and there's alternating back and forth on a loop, right? So. Just to recap, we're going to define an array of eight values. Each of those values is five bits long, and each of those bits is going to be either zero or one, depending on whether we want our our uh, our dot in that character when it's displayed to be on or off. Then we're going to use this create character, create char command uh, to tell it which, uh, which of our eight positions we want to store that data in and where our data is in our code referenced by its name. And then we can use the LCD write command to print those custom characters to the screen, just like any of the other characters that we have stored in our ROM. Make sense? So just to prove that this is actually driving the data for, um, for our display here, let's, uh, let's make a broken heart. Just edit our heart data there to put a line through the middle. I don't know if this will look any good. This is something I'm making up on the fly. But if I upload that now, we should see, oh, I broken heart Arduino. It's so sad. So you can see that the, the ones and zeros in that array are directly encoding how that, uh, how that custom character appears on the screen there. Cool. Questions? Mm. Shout them out if you got them. I need to load up another bit of code here. I will, uh, I'll let you guess which, uh, which code it is. If you squint really hard, those of you who have really, really high resolution displays can maybe tell what it is already. Um, but, uh, 
For those of you who have been waiting on the loading bar all night, we are finally there. So here's how we made that loading bar demo at the beginning of our evening. I'm just going to upload that code and remind us what it looks like, and then we'll see how I uh, how I built it, um, because I think it's an interesting way to think about how you're defining those custom characters. Because one easy way, right, is to sort of draw them on the screen by making that array of bits and bytes sort of to draw the character on the screen. Um, but in this case, our custom characters are... Actually, I shall... Here, I'll tell you what. Let's... um, let's. I can show you what the custom characters are, I think. Let's see if there's a fast way to do this. Um, yes, there certainly is. So... Well, I'll, I swear I'll walk you through the code in just a second here. I just want to show you what the custom characters are so you start to get a sense of how this thing is built. So I'm going to do lcd.setcursor, zero, zero. And then I'm going to just, I'm just going to have this print my five custom characters that I use for this to the screen uh, using a for loop. Int i equals zero, i is less than or equal to, I guess I have six custom characters, so less than or equal to five, i plus plus, lcd.write uh, byte i. And then, oh, and then I'm going to put a big fat delay here so that it just hangs there at that point in our code so we can um, we can see it. So these are the five custom characters that I use to make this loading screen. I have an empty byte here, which I really didn't need, right? I have a byte with nothing in it. Although having that be the zeroth position of my custom characters and having it be... Um, unfilled, having to be 0% filled, turned out to be kind of a useful thing for code. Since I only needed these five characters, having a sixth one that's totally empty turned out to be fine in my case. And then I have remaining five characters where just the first column is filled, just the second column, or one and two, one, two, and three, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, five, right? The, the spaces get progressively more filled as we move through our custom character set. So this is custom character zero, it has nothing in it. Custom character one is a single line. Custom character two is two lines, and so on up to a fully filled square. So those are the five or really six custom characters that I defined for the sake of making that um, making that product bar work. Product bar? Oh, I'm losing my mind tonight. Or maybe my mouth. It's all fine. So let me delete that temporary demo code there, and I will show you how the progress bar works. Like all the other LCD code that we've looked at tonight, we include our library, we define where it's hooked up. Um, I created an array uh, a two-dimensional array to hold our data here that is six characters long, and each of those characters has eight sets of bytes in it to hold our data. This is just so I could define these all in one place and not have to write out um, each of those individual characters as its own line. And then I have some timing variables here that I'm using to generate the progress bar later, and we'll see that in a little bit. In this setup function here, I want to show you a couple of functions that we haven't looked at before and that we'll, we'll see again in a second. I've got this lcd.begin, of course, with uh, 16 columns and two lines. Um, I've also done lcd.no cursor and lcd.no blink. So the LCD has the ability to display, if you like it, a little underline automatically where your next character is going to be printed. Um, and it can also blink a cursor um, over the whole top of that character where, where your cursor is placed for the next character to be printed. If you're doing an application where you are showing the user where they're going to be entering data or where they're having an effect, using this cursor can be really useful. For our purposes, I, I don't want the users to be thinking about where the cursor is, so I've turned those both off. We'll be making use of both cursor and blink for our RGB LED example later in the night, so um, if you're, it's unclear what those do, bear with me. Just know that I'm turning them off for the sake of this example. And then I'm calling this custom characters function, which is the place where I'm loading all my new custom characters um, into the LCD. And I'll look at that in a second here. Then I'm making random things really random, clearing the LCD, which is not necessary. When you, when you begin your LCD, it will clear it for you. Setting my cursor to my top left and printing that loading label, right? So printing that loading, loading line once there. Um, and uh, that will be our label. And then... My loop is very simple. All it's doing is it's incrementing this uh, this count variable by one uh, occasionally. If uh, if a random number uh, is between zero and one hundred is greater than ninety, add one to the count. Uh, and then draw the progress bar using that value, and then wait a few milliseconds. This 12 millisecond value was just something that I, I experimented with until I, I found a value that felt right to me for a progress bar. Because as you might have guessed, I'm not actually loading anything practical with this progress bar. I'm just uh, using it to demo a display. Um, but of course, this could be um, measuring the uh, number of files you've read off of an SD card. It could be um, displaying 
um, relative light sensor readings or relative rotational readings. Um, so this, this progress bar could be representing something other than just a purely random number. For our demo purposes, I'm just giving it random data. So um, let's look first at how we're generating those custom characters. Because if you look at this code, you'll see I'm not actually sort of making those blocks of uh, eight rows of five bits each. I'm doing it programmatically. Um, and if you're interested in like sort of starting to decipher more about how loops can be used to build up data in a very structural way, this is, might be a cool place to start. Um, just as a, a, a place to get you started about how this um, this custom character writing is is created, here's what the here here's if, if if I had been given this piece of code, it was like I wonder how it's um making those vertical lines and the two vertical lines and the three vertical lines. I'm not seeing those blocks of bits anywhere that Jeff was talking about. Let me start to unravel what this custom characters function is doing. Here's where I would start. Hopefully your uh, your programmer who's come before you has given your variables descriptive names because that will make things a little bit easier. So. I'm going to start from the outside in. So I, I see I had this for loop um, for char num going from zero to five. Ah, so char num is going to be our character number because I know I have six custom characters. So I have zero to five. So this is going to reference which character I'm at. Oh, and I see down at the end of that same loop, I'm creating a character in that position with some data reference that position. Okay, that makes sense. So each time I go through this loop, I'm going to be basically defining one character. Okay, so now I understand what that outer loop is doing. So let's move in a loop. Okay, so my next for loop here defines this, ah, the row variable is going to go from zero to seven. So this must be working on each of the individual rows within an individual character. All right, well, that makes sense. Um, so it looks like for uh, this character data, for that character and that row is going to start as all zeros. Okay, so Jeff's setting this to all zeros when we start. So then this next last, this, uh, this last for loop here must be the moneymaker. This is how we're actually setting the ones to be on in the appropriate characters. Okay, so we're looping over each of the columns, but we're only looping as long as the column is less than the character number. Ah, so for character zero, we're actually not looping any times because we're uh, we're starting at zero and zero is not less than zero. So we're skipping this entire for loop, all right? So in character one, we start at zero, but we don't get past zero. So we do this just once for the first column. Then we'll do this for columns one and two, then for columns one, two, and three, and so on. So this must be how we're building up lines one, lines one and two, lines one, two, and three, lines one, two, three, and four, and so on. All right. And then here's where we're actually setting the character data for that particular character for that particular row. And since all the rows are going to be the same, they're all going to look like this. I'm going to add to each of those rows the, <laughs> the binary digit one shifted to the left by the amount four minus the column number. Whoa, so there's a lot packed into that line. So let's break this line apart a little bit. So comment that out, we can break it out apart. So our uh, our row started as 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? We, which is what we set it to just above, just just here, right? So uh, let's say I want to uh, to do the first custom character. I want to uh, I want this to end up as the character uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So how do we get there? Well, one thing we might do, uh, and we'll, we'll see why in a second, is... Uh, we might take the, des the the binary digit one, or in our words, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001, and use this binary left shift operator. It looks like less than, less than, which literally just says, hey, take the binary digits of that number and shift them to the left and start tacking in zeros to the end. So in other words, if I take the number 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 and left shift it by one, what I end up with is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. I've shifted that one, one position to the left. If I shift it to the left again, I've shifted by say two positions, then I end up with zero, zero, one, zero, zero. I'm sort of moving that one over in those columns. So this sort of gives me a really clean way to fill up the columns of my custom characters with the binary data that I need. I'm going to do this um, for the zeroth character, I'm doing this no times. For the first character, I'm taking that one and I'm shifting it all the way over to the left. I'm shifting it four times so it ends up say, in this first place here. And then, of course, all of our rows are the same. So this ends up being what we want it to be, you know, a line all the way down the left side of our character. For the next character, the second custom character, I'm doing this twice. I'm going through the loop once and shifting it over four times, then going through the loop again and shifting it over three times, and so on. And that's how we're building up our, our five custom characters. So each time, each time the, char the char num, each time we advance one character through our outer loop, 
we get to go one more time through our innermost loop. Uh, and when we do, we set the we set another column of that character to be all ones. I realize when I <laughs> I didn't necessarily intend to get into binary shift operators tonight, so if it feels like my explanation is a little bit rusty, I do apologize. Um, we should probably come back and do a, an evening where we talk a little bit more about binary operations because we've, we've bumped into them a couple times already. Um, but just know that when you're getting in here and being like, "What? Where the heck is he defining those custom characters?" He's doing it programmatically inside this custom characters function. You could certainly define each character separately as a block of bits and bytes. Nothing wrong with that. This was just a uh, sort of a condensed way for me to define the six characters that I needed. Cool. Let me take a quick pause for beer and questions and then we'll we'll move back on to to what this this function is doing. Let's see. Um uh yeah the 447 ace does support scrolling. Yeah. Um haven't done haven't done scrolling yet in the example. Um Palmer says, I heard the 30 character number at some point, we don't know if it was the max LCD display size or the max text length. It is both. So inside the, the controller itself, it is thinking of this as two lines of, in my case, two lines of 40 characters each. Uh, and then this is actually position 41 and then position 42 and 43. When you write in your Arduino code to say, hey, go to uh, say line two, position 13, it does the math for you and sends the right value to the, the display. So it shows up in the right spot, but internally, this is a 40 by 2 display, if that makes sense. Ken says, I've done this, but just using the array, so I didn't need to try to understand that code later again. Yeah, there is something like, <laughs> as my maybe like rambling seven minute this explanation exemplifies, like this is kind of um, as a little bit impenetrable <laughs> as a bit of code here. Um, so if you were writing this to like reuse later, writing it as just arrays might actually be a better practice than getting all fancy with your custom character creator here. Um, so the one part of this code that we haven't touched on yet is how is it actually drawing the bar on the screen, um, given that it, it's told that it needs to sort of draw this progress bar with this count. And where I got this value of 80 from, I said, you know, count is going to increment by one sort of semi-randomly, and then I'm going to take the remainder mod 80. So it's going to max out at 80 and loop back to zero. And the reason for 80 is that I have 16 uh, characters and each one has five possible positions of filledness, let's say. So five times 16, I have 80 possible positions for fullness of the length of my progress bar. So given that, I want to draw this progress bar based on a value between zero and 80 on my screen. So how am I gonna do that? Well, uh, I first I'm gonna start by saying, well, how many of those blocks are just gonna be all five columns full? Um, how, you know, how, what's not, what, basically everything up until the last character is going to be entirely filled up. You can see this is just a line of fully filled blocks and one at most partially filled block. So how many full blocks are there? Well, it's just gonna be the, the overall position divided by five. And when we're working in integers like this, when we do division, it automatically cuts off the decimal part for us, right? So if we were to put in, say we're at position 47, we're a little bit over halfway to 80. Uh, if I divide that by five, I get uh, uh, 47 divided by five is 9.4. Chops that off, I have nine full blocks to draw to the screen. How many uh, partial, uh, then then I'm gonna decide, well, okay, so I have my nine full blocks, let's say, for our example of position 47. How many additional lines do I need to draw in that partial block to make up the rest of my display? Well, I'm gonna subtract out five times full blocks, right? It's basically how many columns have I already uh, drawn? and I'm gonna subtract that from my original position. So in this case, I'm gonna say I need, let's say 47 lines drawn to the screen. Uh, I'm gonna subtract nine times five or 45. So I need two lines for my partial block drawn to the screen. Cool. From there, once we have those numbers figured out, it's just a matter of writing the appropriate number of full blocks. So in this case, I'm going to loop from zero to my number of full blocks, set the cursor to the appropriate position and draw my fully filled block, which is byte five in my case, right? I have fifth custom character, right? Then I'm going to set my cursor to the position just past where that full block ends. And I'm going to write the byte corresponding to partial blocks. And this is why I wrote an empty block at the very beginning of, um, of my custom characters, because it means that byte zero in my case has zero columns filled with it. Byte one has one column, byte two has two columns and so on. Um, and that just makes this point in the code really easy where I can say, hey, how many um, how many additional partial columns do I need? Oh, I'll just take that byte, that custom character and drop it in here at the appropriate place. Cool. And then 
um, just to make sure their things are cleaned up. I'm going from that position forward to the end of the line, so past where my cursor just ended, to the end of the line here at position 15, and writing it with those empty bytes that I defined earlier. So I'm making sure I'm clearing out the rest of my line. Otherwise, bad things happen. In fact, I can show you bad things happening um, because uh, the first time that I wrote this code, bad things happened. Looks like we're uploaded. Can you guess what's going to happen? Now that I took out that part that writes empty, empty lines past the end of the progress bar. We'll see right here. You'll see I'm still incrementing through the beginning of my code, but until I wrote that extra bit of code in, there was nothing removing those additional full blocks from the end of the screen until the new progress bar got to that point. So that's why I needed this this clear command. Now I could also, I could have done this in a number of different ways, right? I could say, hey, when you get to the end of the progress bar or when you start a new one, just wipe that full line or clear it out entirely. Also totally valid. I just like the, the idea of like, hey, I'm just going to wipe that full line whenever I write this progress bar out. It just seemed like a clean way to do this because this would also let me say, you know, right now I'm writing this progress bar in order from say zero to 80, but I can also use this progress bar, um, to just write an arbitrary value to the screen. Like I could say at the end of my setup function here, draw progress bar uh, 47 and delay a bunch of things. Um, and even though I haven't been writing to this progress bar in order, I can still use that as a positional display for the number 47. Make sense? Cool. Okay, a quick pause for questions here. Um, for a second, I thought you said it was time for fear and questions. Yeah, beer beer is definitely better. Kenneth says, kind of a neat effect. Yeah, so one of the fun things about writing your own sort of like custom bytes to do semi-graphical things in this is that sometimes you mess them up or like you write your bytes, say, in reverse order um, and neat things happen. And so you can sort of start cataloging like, oh, I, I kind of messed that up, but I kind of like this better than the thing I was doing. Like if I was writing a... Um, a program that wanted to say, uh, just indicate that something was loading uh, without necessarily um, indicating that it was going to be done at any particular point in time. Let's speed this up a little bit too. Um, I might do something like erase that like reloading part of my code. I just let the project bar fill up and then just continue spinning. Like I think that kind of has a nice like spinning processing wheel to it. Like, oh yeah, something's still happening in there, but I'm not expecting it to finish at any given time. So I don't know, kind of a fun thing. So I encourage you to play around with custom characters like this um, and think about how you might be able to create sort of some, some neat graphical demos with it. I wanna share one more graphical demo with you and then I wanna build our LCD and RGB LED integrated control space here. Cause I think that'll be a nice sort of combination of the things that we've looked at tonight. Um, but for a bit of fun first, um, this will be the, uh, the wave demo bit of code if you are following along uh, with the code on the website. Let's load that up here. Let's see. Well, let's just let's just run it to start with and hopefully it runs just fine and uh, then we'll come back and we'll take a just a quick stroll through the code this is one i you know the specifics of how this code actually works um i think uh are not super important for tonight but i think this is a, a fun way to sort of show things that you can do with an lcd display ken says for a temperature controller to show the recent trend yeah oh <laughs> ken says i've used eight custom characters to do a little bar graph that's essentially what we're doing here right so you might be able to tell i have eight custom characters that start from one line full to eight lines full and in this case i'm just animating them to do a little wave here but you could absolutely use them to display um temperature as kenneth says um you could use them to uh display um, maybe do a centering effect. Like if you had a device that needed to be precisely aligned, you could use it as a visual feedback for a year to say, hey, I want this to you know, keep that wave in the center as other forces sort of push it side to side. If there was something that was sort of non-obvious in terms of what was happening inside your, 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 um, your machinery here. You could also, if you wanted to get really creative, you could double the resolution of your display by saying right now, I'm only using these custom characters here on the bottom line, right? So I have eight sort of eight possible values. I could also use this upper line here and have 16 possible values, right? I could go from zero all the way up to 16 um, and sort of think about, you know, how uh, ways you could graph with more more flexibility there, right? So I could fill up the whole screen with a, whole, a full a full size graph, if you will. 
if that sort of makes sense. So in any case, like I say, the code is not necessarily the point of this, um, but just to know like there is another point where we are defining our custom characters. And again, I'm doing it programmatically. You could also define them just as an array. Uh, and then I'm printing the label to the screen. And then each time I go through my loop, I'm adjusting sort of where the center point of my wave is, drawing the biggest character there. And then on either side of it, sort of stepping down characters until I get to the smallest possible size and carrying that out to sort of the end of the display. So you can see see my, my variable that tracks where the peak of my wave is, is sort of incrementing up and down through this loop. And as it does, it's uh, it's printing that the largest, the eight row character there, and then printing smaller characters on either side until it gets to the end. Again, go to the website, check out the code, and I, I think it will be illustrative. This is also a really a great example of like what happens when you um when you screw up your loading. So like, for example, here, this, this custom character loader is working in very much the same way. Um, uh, it's, it's looping through all the characters and based on each one, it's deciding which bits to fill in and which bits not to fill in for each of those filled characters. But let's say I do something like um, I'm going to define the characters in reverse order. So instead of going from zero to eight, I'm going to go from eight to zero. Oops, greater than or uh, let's see, row equals seven. Row is greater than or equal to zero and subtract. Upload that. Oops, what's happening here? typo, upload that, and we'll see what happens. Maybe nothing. Oh, <laughs> nothing in that case. <laughs> so reversing the order in which we load them didn't actually make a difference. Um, but let's see, what would make a difference here? Oh, let's reverse the order in which we load them here. We'll go starting at character eight, uh, I guess character seven, character is greater than or equal to zero and we'll decrease our character number. So we'll sort of load them in reverse order in that way. No, that didn't make a difference either. <laughs> it took me so long to find the exact combination of things that worked and now I, now I can't fuck it up. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, let's see here. How could I, how could I make it? Well, one thing I could do is I could reverse the ones and the zeros, right? I could say, uh, I reverse the logic that turns a row on or off, right? And now I had this kind of fun inverted wave, right? Because every row that was a one is now a zero and everything that was a zero is now a one. So that's pretty good. I'm seeing a bit of flickering on the camera there. In fact, I can see just a little bit of it, little bit of it in person too. It's much worse on the camera than it is in person. So just you're getting a sense of like how often you can refresh these without seeing flicker. Um, that is, you know, a, a pretty reasonable refresh rate, I would say for these. So in any case, go download the code, mess around with it yourself, see if you can make it do fun things. I think just, just a little example of like fun things you can do with these displays. You should also, both of these examples so far have loaded their custom symbols at the beginning of the code and then made use of them. There's no reason you can't define additional characters in the middle of your code. So for example, let's say I had a, um, a use case in some part of my program that needed a horizontal progress bar. And sometime later, I needed a vertical graph. There's no reason I couldn't say load the progress bar, maybe do some initial loading. Maybe this is the screen that shows up when I'm waiting for my stepper motor driver to initialize or waiting for my um, my fans to spin up to speed. And then it's gonna switch over to being say a, a graph of recent temperatures. Let's say Kenneth's example, just recent, you know, I could have this set of custom characters, my vertical lines defined at the beginning of my code. And then I could load my vertical graph characters later in my code when I need them. Totally valid. You will end up sort of eating up program space the more things you add. But in this case, a couple sets of custom characters for most applications probably won't break the bank. So something worth thinking about as you're playing with custom characters. Cool. All right. Questions. Chris says goodbye 90 minutes. Yeah, we missed we missed 90 minutes a while ago. But when when have we ever when have we ever hit it? Mm. So what I want to do is combine our two examples from this evening. I want to combine our LCD example and I want to combine our RGB LED example. So I'm going to Frankenstein those two things together a little bit here. I'm going to take my RGB LED breadboard from earlier and reassemble it a little bit since I tore it apart to try and get that bicolor LED working. There we go. We'll reattach our red there and we'll make sure we have the connections in the right order. Red green, blue, I don't think so. Red. Oh, I see. Doing this sort of live on air is always exciting. So that's going to be what? Oh, hang on. That should be 
there. Red, green, and blue. Not red, green, and blue. Make sure that we plug each one into a separate spot on our breadboard here. And I think I'm probably going to have to change some parameters for what's plugged in where, but I think that will that will do for the moment. Clear that guy out. And once again, we'll plug our control lines, hopefully into the same places on our board as earlier. If not, I will fix it in code. I typically write my code, I will say, at, you know, even when I'm writing it for a thing I will install in self, m install myself, I will w write the code assuming that I will screw up how I've wired it or how I've designed it to be wired when I install the thing, um, because I almost always do. So it's good to have your connections stored in variables um, and not do any tricky math based on what pins things are actually connected to, because nine, nine times out of nine, whoever's installing it, even if it's you, even if you wrote the code yourself, you will often end up um, misinstalling something. Now real quickly, just check my connections here. Yes, yes, yes. I think I have my colors out of order, but that's something, like I say, we can fix in code. Um, I'll tell you a story as I'm uploading the code here, speaking of miswiring connections. Um, a similar uh, exhibit that I was working on recently at my place of work um, needed, I built an Arduino driven interpreter to take some data out of a PLC and put it on a seven segment LED display like we were working on uh, last week and a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, wrote some very clever code that handled the data nicely and spit it all out. And then uh, actually, I don't know if Brian knows this because he was working with me on um, trying to install this thing finally. Um, when I went to install it, I installed the display upside down. <laughs> so it 180 degrees uh, out of where it should be. So um, be I had to go back into my code <laughs> and uh, flip, basically flip all the characters over. And what I did is I defined a bit of code that said, hey, if you installed the display right side up, run this bit of code. Otherwise, if you didn't install it right side up, install this other bit of code. And I just had a variable that said is right side up. I said, if true, run this bit of code that defines the characters right side up. If false, use this other bit of code that says the characters are upside down. Embarrassing, but fixable in code. And that's always a nice thing to be able to do if you can. So let's look at one more bit of code this evening. If you're following along at home, this is the LCD RGB demo from the website. Um, let's upload that first and then once it's working we'll come back and uh, and make it uh, walk through the the code on our IDE. Um, I'm realizing I'm also going to need a couple of buttons to make this work um, but you'll see here what I'm going to do you might be able to tell is I'm going to put the red green and blue values that I want to display on my LCD here and then I'm going to use some buttons to control uh, what those values are I'm going to output them to this LCD in real time so to wire these couple of buttons in here as well and that will take just a further moment there's one there's two and we'll wire those into a couple of buttons let's see if i put in my code what buttons they are oh i see i use a0 and a1 a good reminder that you can use your analog in pins the pins labeled analog in on your uh, arduino uno as um as digital inputs as well. There's no reason they have to be only analog inputs. They are the only pins that can be analog inputs, but they work just as well uh, as digital I/O. So feel free to um, feel free to use them that way, especially as you start to run out of pins. I'm using them here because just the other the amount of fly wires on the other side of my breadboard here is getting kind of out of control. Um, so I thought I would just route a couple connections over here. Alrighty. So. Yeah, it looks like things are working, which is very exciting. I think first time that something has worked first try tonight. Um, Chris said, was it just me or was that loading example working fine for a while, clearing out when it starts over and then at some point no longer clears? Chris, you might have been seeing, depending on how much attention you're, you're paying this evening, you might have been seeing the example that we deliberately glitched. Let's see here. I can reload that. Because this may have been what, oh yeah. Yeah, so we left we left that example in a glitch state here, and you know I'm running on the same hardware, so this will run just fine. We took out the bit of code that um, that deliberately cleared this end of the line when the um, when the progress bar for, you know went back to the beginning there, um, and it just made this kind of interesting effect. So we played with it. Um, but if I if I restore that part of the code that you know clears to the end of the line whenever it writes that progress bar, you'll see now it's fixed. It also <laughs> the LCDs do kind of fun things when you um when you reset them. 
or when their connections come loose. Oops. Oof, something's something's gone horribly wrong. You can see I'm sort of getting bit by not not having firm connections under there. <laughs> oh, these poor pins. I'm also having to reset it, of course, because I'm only defining those custom characters at the very beginning of my code. And so um, it is, if I miss that point in the code where I'm defining those custom characters, it's not going to have them loaded into the proper spot. Ooh, something has gone horribly wrong. Oh, dear. Wow, definitely broken, huh? That's impressive. I'm really kind of overjoyed. There we go. I unbroke it. Troubleshooting live on cam every Sunday night here <laughs> at youtube.com slash not slash Jeff Jeff Glass Glass. That's the other account I made a bunch of years ago and that I will come back to when I reach 100 subscribers because now you have to have 100 subscribers on YouTube to have a custom URL. So when this channel reaches 100 subscribers, I will be able to take that custom URL from myself and give it to myself here on this channel. So someday this will be youtube.com slash Jeff Jeff Glass Glass. But for now, it's some awful string of numbers that I, I can't remember. Uh, well, anyway, coming back from deliberately breaking things to our LCD RGB control code, which is to give you a, a sense of, you know, what you could actually use these LCDs for. Um, I, let's see here. Did I break it again? I hope not. Ooh, I broke it again. <laughs> some connection is very loose under there. There we go. So I have this displaying some red, green, and blue values here. And actually, here, let me let me zoom in on the display first before we do interface. So you can see, let me close, let me turn this off. You can see the little underline under the, uh, under the one in the red display there. That is the cursor that we talked about earlier. So I said it could display a little cursor indicator for you to tell the user where your cursor is. By um, when I initialize my display here, instead of calling no cursor, I'm this time I'm calling cursor because I want that that little line to be displayed so the user can tell if they're going to be changing the red, green, or blue values on this display. I'm currently doing no blink, so I'm not doing a blinking cursor, but here, let me, let me enable blink, so lcd.blink, and I'll show you what that cursor looks like because that may be useful as well. Come back over here. You can see I now have this blinking cursor here that tells me that I'm going to be altering the red value. For multi, um, multi character values, uh, this is just a personal preference. I don't think that blinking is particularly communicative. This says to me I'm going to be typing at this position and I'm not. I'm just going to be incrementing. Um, so I'm, I'm choosing as a style choice to do no blink um, for this particular application, but that may be a useful thing for you to do um, for, for the kind of application that you're using. So what I am doing with this display, if I zoom out a little bit here, I'll leave the lights a little bit low. It's getting a little later in the evening. I'm using these two buttons to increment the value of red, green, and blue that are present in my RGB LED. Currently, I just have a button which increments the cursor one position to the next, and a button which increments that currently selected value by a certain amount every second. So not a particularly precise control, um, but you can see I can increase, like if I decrease the green down to zero, Increase the blue, increase the red. Let's see here. I guess I should have checked that everything was wired properly before I did this. Let's turn everything down to zero. And actually, this is a device I could use to tell me if everything was configured properly. Let's turn just the blue on. Looks like that's just green. Looks like blue is green. How about red? Red is red. Blue is nothing. And blue is green. Well, that's the thing we can fix. So already <laughs> this is proving to be a useful application because it's telling me that my uh, my little RGB LED is miswired. So I have my, what is currently hooked up to blue is controlling the green. So that must be five and green must be on pin six. So re-upload and see if that fixes anything. Let's see, let's turn, oops, I broke it again. Broke it again. <laughs> Oof, yeah, it does all kinds of exciting things. This is partly, if you see something like this on your display, do not panic. Um, it just means you have a, a missing connection there, especially on those data bits, right? If all of those data pins are not sufficiently connected, um, you won't have uh, things displaying properly. Let's see. That might be... There we go. <laughs> oh, man. A fidgety display tonight, for sure. So let's see here. So red... Red is still red, because I can see I have my red going from green down to red here. Oh, I broke it again. Oh, something is really borked under there, huh? Well, that's going to make things real sad. Let's plug that in one more time. There 
There we go. <laughs> Stop bum. Yeah, I'll try, I'll, I'll try not to breathe on it too much. Um, of course, if you were to do what I started to do and actually solder wire connections to it or use DuPont connectors, you'd have a much firmer connection. Um, my sort of hubris and shoving this into a breadboard is biting me in the butt here a little bit. Um, but that's all right. Looks like green is now green, red is now red, and blue is just not connected, which just tells me that I have a wiring error somewhere. Oh, yes, it's because my blue is not plugged into my blue. Yes, blue. Green is blue. Green is green. And red is red. There we go. So that's getting a little bit closer. So now you can see as I'm, oops, as I'm, <laughs> as I'm incrementing through my values and trying not to hose my LCD display, I am in real time updating the, uh, well, if I could un, if I could unbork my display here, you can see how when I change my values in real time, I'm updating the, the values shown on my LCD. Kenneth makes the really good value here that this is why you don't take breadboards into the real world. I have definitely seen this both in theaters and in installation work. Breadboards are not meant for doing permanent work. Um, they are for exactly what we're doing here tonight, which is playing around, prototyping, bodging something together, figuring out what the form factor of your final thing is, and then you want to make your project permanent in some way. Um, where there are a number of ways to do that. Um, there are um, what are called perf boards, um, which are little circuit boards with holes um, that you uh, can put your components into and solder them down to, which if you're using all through hole devices is a really easy way to go. Um, there are perf boards out there that replicate the layout of a breadboard. So instead of sticking your components down um, into a breadboard temporarily, you stick them in the exact same orientation into this breadboard prototyping perf board and solder them in place and your circuit will work exactly the same, except that it'll be soldered in place and it will last much longer than if it was in a breadboard. Um, Brian says, I hope something starts smirking. Sm smoking? Yeah, it's it's certainly possible. We're, we're not looking particularly promising here tonight, are we? Oof. We've had quite a few fails over the... All right, well, the display is back up now, and you could you had a few seconds of it showing how it was matching up with the, uh, the colors on the LED. Let's jump over to the code while this thing just sits here and looks pretty, and I'll show you um, how you might think about um, if you have an interface like this, tracking where your cursor is and what values you're modifying. So... Um, let's do, let's just look through our code here. So much like before, we include our liquid crystal library. We define how our LCD is attached. No surprises there. We have our same red, green, and blue attachment pins. And you can see I've used pins A0 and A1 for my button, uh, my button connections here. Um, you'll see when I come down here to the setup function, I've defined them as our favorite input pull-up type. Really useful as always. And the rest of the setup function um, uses, uh, says I'm going to enable the cursor. I'm not going to do any blink and I'm going to use this display colors function, which is going to create that display on the screen that we just saw. And we'll look at that in a second here. Um, I have stored up in my variables here, three useful variables, a cursor index, this display positions array and how many positions that is. And this is how I'm managing which of red, green, or blue my cursor is pointing at and which one I want to increment when I press that increment button. So I'm going to say, hey, my cursor index is going to be either 0, 1, or 2. If my cursor index is 0, I want my cursor to end up at position 0 all the way to the left. If my cursor index is 1, I want to have my cursor at position 6. If I put my cursor index at position 2, I want it to be at position 12. I'm saying, hey, these, these are the only places I want this cursor to end up. Let me put them in an array here so I can manage them. Um, I'm using some timing variables to be able to tell when I should be able to push a button. And we'll see that in a little bit as well. And then I have variables to store the current state of the red, green, and blue outputs to my LED. So all my loop function is doing is saying, hey, check buttons and display colors. And you see I'm doing if check buttons display colors. So this check buttons function is going to hand us back a true or false value. And what I'm doing, and this is a, um, this is an, a useful programming pattern when you're dealing with a, a simple application like this, where you know it, you need to take some simple action based on whether or not a button or a series of buttons is going to be pressed. So this check buttons function might do a number of things. Um, it might, uh, in our case, it's going to read from some buttons. It could read from a joystick. It could read some previous states of buttons, but it's also going to hand back a true or false value that says, hey, um, if we need to take some action based on the fact that some buttons are pressed, return true. 
um, if uh, if we don't need to take any action, return false. In our case, if we do need to take some action, we're just gonna refresh the display by calling this display colors function again. And the display colors function is not particularly complicated. We're just gonna clear the screen, set our cursor to the top left and print red, then set it to the second line and print the value of our red variable. And say we're gonna print our green label and print the value of our green variable, print blue and the value of our blue variable. And then we're gonna set the cursor to a position of this display positions array that we had earlier. So depending on where our index currently is, I'm gonna set that cursor to be zero, six, or 12. So we'll make sure we set our cursor back to that position so the user knows where they're going to be affecting things. This cursor, this little blinking line that's telling the user where they're affecting things, is the exact same cursor that the LCD is using to print things to the screen. So when I'm doing things like set cursor 12-0 print blue, the cursor will end up at the uh, just after this blue label. And if I want that line to be somewhere else to tell the user something, I need to manually set it back there at the end of my display code, if that makes sense. Um, and then my check buttons function is a, a little bit complicated. Um, but uh, the salient points are, and we're, we're using this, you know, check if uh, if the time is greater than the last time we checked on the baby, plus the amount of time we have to wait between checking on babies. You may remember this example from last time, right? It prevents us from um, when you know from from reading a button too many times too fast. It says, you know, hey, if um, if that button is pressed, if that button is low, um, then increment that cursor index. So increment it by one, and then uh, take the remainder modulo three. And actually, this can be the remainder modulo the total number of positions, right? So there's gonna be 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, um, and then check the other button. And if it is pressed, I want to increment uh, my current value, my red, my green, or my blue by a small amount. Um, so, you know, if, if it's time to check that button again, if that button is low, um, then I want to uh, remember that, this, that the button was pressed at this time. And then I'm gonna use this new structure that I, we, we breezed past a little bit earlier, this switch case syntax, um, which can be useful when you're dealing with things in a discrete number of cases like we are here. If the index is at zero, I want to affect red. If it's at one, affect green. If it's at two, affect blue. And I could do this with if statements, right? I could say, uh, for example, uh, let's zoom in a little here. If uh, cursor index equals zero, do something, right? And then uh, else if cursor index equals one, do something else, right? Um, but for cases where we're, especially where we're dealing with sort of numerical data, especially if it's, you know, in, in, in integer order, one, two, three, you can also do this with text matching, with strings, um, this switch case syntax is really nice and clean and here's how it works you say i'm going to switch to the case specified by a variable in this case my cursor index and close it all in brackets and say all right my first case when the cursor index is zero colon do the following and then break off when i hit this break line i'm going to jump to the end of uh jump to the outside of my curly brackets here all right if my cursor index is one, I'm gonna to jump to here, jump to my first case, do this code, and then break off, jump to the end of my curly brackets. So this is exactly the same as doing, you know, if cursor index is zero, do this, else if it's one, do this, else if it's two, do this, and so on. It's just kind of a cleaner way to write these things out. Um, do remember to put this break statement in here. If you don't, like if we took this out, this bit of code would say, if cursor index is zero, do this bit of code, and then it will gladly just carry right on over into this bit of code, um, which is probably, probably not what you want it to do. Might be for some specific cases what you want it to do, but typically you'll see a break statement at the end of each of these case statements here. So in my case, I'm saying, hey, if the cursor index is zero, I want my red to increase by a small amount. I think button increment is five throughout this code. Um, and then I want to take the remainder modulo 255. So when I get to 255, wrap around back to zero. If the cursor index is one, if my cursor is on my green label, then I want to increment the green variable and wrap around. And if the case is two, increment the blue variable and wrap around. So I'm using this switch statement to tell me which of my variables I'm incrementing uh, at any given time. Um, after all that, I'm setting my LED color to match, assuming the LED works. And then I'm returning true in this case, right? This is all within like, if the button is pressed, return true. Also up here, if the button is pressed, return true. And so I know when I'm looking at my buttons, if I get a true value back, I need to resend everything to the display. If I get a false value back, I won't do anything and I'll try the loop again. So I'm, I'm using this function both to do some things and update some values 
and returning a value that the rest of the code can use to decide if it needs to take further action, if that sort of makes sense. Let's look at some quickie quick questions. Let's see here. Um, yeah, male to female DuPont connectors are, are certainly better um, than, uh, than shoving things in a breadboard here. Shoving things in a breadboard, I should say, is, is generally better than this, um, partly because I've had to sort of monge my connectors to make them fit inside this, this across this row of this breadboard. It's not going super well. Um, but if I, you know, had chosen more wisely and used this display with its single row of connectors, I think we'd probably be fine. I got a little bit sketched out by this one because, sidebar, it's got this little uh, LED soldered onto the side here to do its backlight, which just uh, didn't give me great, great hopes for its provenance, but perhaps it would have worked a little bit better. Um, Chris said, to ever make a custom PCB shield instead of using a perf board? Um, I have certainly made custom PCBs and made them for Arduinos. Um, I typically, if I'm going to move into an application space, I'm not going to use a shield form factor, um, although that certainly is an option. But if I'm going to do something integrated, I will typically choose to use a smaller um, a smaller form factor of Arduino. Like I'll use one of those Arduino Pro Minis we've been playing around with just because the size is so much smaller. And, and honestly, that's usually all I need. Um, Palmer says we should call it a PCB board. Yeah, PCB board for printed circuit board. I probably have said that in the past 30 seconds as well. You guys know me a little bit by this point, huh? Chris says, how's that mini moving light project? Worthy of a follow-up, I think. Um, so, um, in any case, that's I, all of a sudden, we've sort of come to the end of our evening. This is the last example of our evening. Um, and I sort of wanted to get through that example so that we could see the switch case command um, in action. So we can see, you know, right now our cursor is on this red variable here. And when I press the increment button, red increments. When I press this other button, that cursor index variable increases by one. And now my cursor is on the green variable here. When I press that, the green variable increases. When I press the increment button again, the cursor moves over to blue and the blue variable increases. And when I press it one more time, because we're taking that cursor cursor uh, index variable modulo three, we jump back to one. So if you're doing a very simple sort of set and forget of, of parameters, this may be useful to you um, in terms of stepping through various places where your cursor can be and using another control to increment or decrement them. Obviously, partly just using two buttons just because I'm a little bit lazy. If you had left and right buttons and up and down buttons, you could certainly imagine a case where you could increment or decrement these values, of course, or move left or right instead of always moving to the right. But this is just a little demo to get you thinking about how you might be, um, how you might be using them as an interface. Um, since we're, since we're coming to the end of our evening, I did want to share one cool thing that somebody shared with me over the course of, uh, of the week, in fact, it's a little bit earlier today. Um, so like a little bit of show and tell, um, which is that earlier, Brian sent me a really cool video that I wanna share with you. Let's see. In which uh, he inc he implemented with a bunch of LEDs and a potentiometer, um, this function where turning the potentiometer individually turns on the LEDs as you move through the range of the pot. Let's see that again. We can see nice DuPont wires coming off of the Arduino there, coming, we got our current limiting resistors and all tied into this power rail over on the other side, which must be tied back uh, probably to ground, I would guess. Um, super cool, what a cool function. You can imagine like this is now sort of like a positional encoder for where that potentiometer is turned, right? Like this, if this potentiometer was hooked up to say a, an alignment lever, um, you could use these LEDs to tell you, hey, this is the, the uh, if this is the acceptable range, this is the less acceptable range, or maybe the blue LEDs in this illustration correspond to places where it's um, more likely to get stuck, so move it out of the blue range really quickly. It's a really cool, um, it's a really neat application. Um, I did also, I just wanted to share the code with y'all, um, just because it's, I, I want to, I hope it's cool to, to be sharing this stuff with you, because I really like to see people make things with this stuff. I think it's really, really cool. And, and Brian's using a lot of the techniques that we've looked at in the past few weeks. Um, we won't go all the way super deep into it, but you can see he's using an array to hold his LED pins. He's got a, a, a pin to find where his potentiometer has hooked up. Um, he's defining all his pins as outputs. Um, and then he's reading an analog value and saying, hey, for each of my pins, uh, if the value of my potentiometer is in between these ranges that I've defined for that LED, turn the LED pin on. Otherwise, turn it off and write it to the serial port so I can tell what that value of the potentiometer is. I love seeing this serial code in here, Brian, because I think it probably was really helpful in determining like what is the behavior that I want to see out of this LED, right? It's like, oh, well, the potentiometer is at 400, but I, I think the LED should be behaving this way at this point in its range. So now I can adjust the math based on what I'm seeing out of this LED, out of this, um, out of this serial port. Um, 
yeah, really super cool. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I hope as the rest of you, you know, continue to build things and make things, I hope you'll send me pictures, send me videos, send me questions. Um, I think the Twitter, Jeff .glass, or uh, Jeffers Glass, listed down below is probably the easiest way to get them to me. But uh, put them in a comment on the video, um, send them to the contact form on Jeff.Glass, whatever is easy for you um, is super, super cool. Um, Chris says, is there a way to do it where it increments by a value, but you just have to release the button and press it again to have it increment the next set? Oh, Chris, I think I see what you're saying here. Um, yeah, it kind of got me too. Yeah, when you would you'd be incrementing when you detected a button going from pressed to unpressed. So we could probably make that up really quick. Um, so what Chris is saying is we have currently two buttons. When we press one, oh, I don't want to, oh, it's a, oh, she's a touch of devil. Uh, when I press one button down here, there we go. I'm moving the cursor from one position to the next. And when I press the other button, I'm incrementing that variable. Um, so what to do Chris's idea where I'm jumping to the next, um, uh, jumping to the next index in the display when I release the button, uh, I'm just going to change my check buttons function here. Um, I'm going to, first of all, comment out all of this code related to the last right button press time code. Um, and instead, so I'm going to need to detect not only if the button is low, but if the button goes from low to high. So I'm going to need a new variable called, uh, let's see, int um, last button state. Uh, and we'll say that it starts high. Um, and I will say, let's see. And I'm going to need the current button state as well. So I'm going to say int uh, current state. Do a little live coding for you here and we'll, we'll make up a solution to this. Digital uh, current state equals digital read uh, increment button. So now we're storing, instead of just using this value in line, we're going to store it in a variable so we have it. So we can just get rid of this digital read and say current state. So now we should still be able to increment, but of course we haven't, we haven't, um, we haven't put back in our functionality to jump to the next index yet. So if current state is low, uh, we'll do all this, all this GAC, and then let's make sure we're at the right. Yes, we'll say uh, else if, uh, so else if current state equals high and last state equals low. So we're transitioning from low to high, we're releasing the button, then I'm going to increment my position by one. And I guess I'll still return true, so we redraw, redraw our display in that case. And then I just need to make sure that I am um, updating the, the state of last state. So I'm gonna do that right at the top here. I'm gonna say last state equals current state. So I'm gonna take the state from the previous loop uh, and load it into last state, and then I take a new current state here. And if I haven't screwed anything up, well, I haven't defined that variable. What did I call that? Last button state. I'm gonna use a very useful function to find and replace to replace last state with last button state. Place all. Upload. We'll see if I've made any errors. I certainly have. Current state is not defined. That seems unlikely. Oh, I, I, it's true. I'm gonna say int current. Ah, okay, so here's a problem. So the reason it's giving me an error here that's saying current state not defined is I'm defining my current state variable here and I'm using it the line before up here. So what I really should be doing is defining my current state variable up at the top of my program um, with everything else so that I can use it over and over again between loops through the code. We'll see if that works. Now I know this has been a fidgety code nonetheless, but let's see if we can get that working. So when I press and hold the button, you can see the red incrementing there. And then when I release, the counter increments to green. And when I press and release, press and release, press and release. So that works. So Chris, that would be a way to solve that problem. This might be useful if you really only wanted the user to have one button to interact with, which you might. You might be limited in your choice of enclosure. Um, you might uh, have one, let's say, you're, I know uh, Chris does some outdoor based things that might be a little exposed to the rain. Let's say you have uh, one really nice weatherproof button. Um, and, but not two, you only wanted to have a one button interface, this might be um, something you could do. Chris saying, I was thinking about the value numbers going up, but I see how to do it. Yeah, so you could certainly flip this on its head, right? You could, um, 
Chris said you want a less touchy interface instead of a... Oh, you meant when you press the button and release it, it would only go up by one. I misunderstood. Well, that I think you could certainly... You, I will leave that as an exercise to the reader, right? Um, and I think the place, to, <laughs> the place to start would be, you know, the, the core idea to take away from this, this other thing that I invented apparently out of whole cloth is um, this idea of using uh, two variables to track the state that the button was in on the previous loop and the state that the button is that we read on the current loop. And then either at the start, or at the end of that loop, you say, hey, remember the, the, the previous state is now going to be a copy of the current one, and then we'll update the current state. So you could certainly take that idea and implement it to say, you know, uh, only increment this uh, this value um, on the change between states instead of whenever we pass through this loop and uh, and the button is held down, if that makes sense. So hopefully there's um some value coming coming out of the uh, the gobbledygook that I made up there. I think there is. I think you can take that idea. That idea of like, you know, the remember the last state and check the current state. And if they're different, do something is a way of um, checking on the, um, checking on whether the state of an input, the state of a button has changed. Um, Chris says, thinking of a way to set a DMX address via a button. Oh, sure. Yeah, certainly. Um, so DMX, for those who may not have run across it, is a, um, a serial control protocol with 512 possible addresses, and you hook all of your devices together in one long daisy chain, and you configure the address on each one to respond to only a specific subset of the instructions in each packet of data. And so each device needs a way to, um, on it, configure what, um, what chunks of data it should be listening to. Sometimes it's on an LCD display, um, sometimes it's dip switches, I think it has nine tiny switches, yeah, so you could have nine switches that set the individual bits of that address address. Um, you can have rotary thumb switches uh, corresponding often to the digits, the hundreds, tens, and thousands, or hundreds, tens, and ones digits of that display. Um, you could have two joysticks and have the worst interface ever. Like there's lots of possible ways to do it. Um, but you could certainly do it with an LCD display like this one. Um, Chris has about the same number of pins needed, I guess. Yeah, certainly possible. Another way you could possibly do it, Chris, and this will segue nicely into what we're going to talk about next week. After a deliberately slow sip of beer. Next week, we're going to talk about infrared remotes. Um, a lot of kits come with these. Um, and I think they're a really fun way of doing some additional input and output uh, to the device. Um, I just bought a new one because the one that came with my kit ages ago is lost or broken. Um, yours may look different from mine. Um, they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, but I think what we what we come up with will um, will certainly be be useful um, in terms of controlling lots of different things. And this is honestly this is what I think of when I think of you know uh, doing multiple digit input to an Arduino device. Maybe something where you could individually type in the digits would be a useful thing for you, Chris. Um, we'll also look at um, IR transmitting, right? So currently this is an IR transmitter and it comes with a little IR receiver kit. Um, we'll also look at you know, discrete sort of IR receivers and implementing your own IR transmitters. So you could say, um, use your Arduino to control your television or your DVD player or your little remote control LED candles. Um, it's a, a project that I have done quite a number of times now. And I would love to share with you how we can use IR transmitters and receivers with the Arduino to do some, um, to do some fun things. And this may open up some more possibilities for how you can get complicated data into your Arduino, especially if you're thinking about putting it out on a graphical display. So that's the teaser for next week. Um, I think, you know, I, every single week I've been like, oh, we're going to do this and we'll do that and the other and the other thing too. I think I really want to focus on IR receivers and applications next week. Um, and I think that will be a whole lot of fun. IR receivers, I should say, and transmitters. Um, so we are going to loop in some other topics, right? We're going to talk about a little bit about higher power IR transmitters because we'll need to use some transistors or FETs to get some additional power out. Um, we're going to need to talk about um, current limiting with resistors, all Ohm's law from a couple weeks ago. It's going to sort of touch on a lot of things, but I think this will be a, a fun add to our, our set of skills. This I got from a micro center for apparently for $10 and 49 cents. Um, they're also available on Amazon and I will have a link, uh, in next week's, um, video page and description too. If you want to buy one to play with before next week, you certainly can. Um, let's see. Chris Wick says the fun home TV. Yeah, well, yeah, having IR control of things is super fun uh, and can be somewhat frustrating because most IR control devices are not um, not super smart. So um, 
So we will, uh, we'll, we'll see the, the advantages and the limitations of this. I'm gonna have to figure out how to drag some IR controlled devices in here to play with. I mean, I've got a candle and I've got, you know, we can plug an Arduino into the receiver so that it can receive things, but it would be a lot more fun. I've been meaning to bring the composite TV from the guest room in here for some other unrelated projects related to a 10 megahertz signal and channel six. So maybe, maybe if uh, my family is amenable, I will do that for next week because that would give us a fun thing to play with. Let's see. In any case, uh, I think that's going to be it for this week. Thank you again for spending another wonderful Sunday night with me. <laughs> I know things got a little bit silly and honestly a little bit broken tonight, um, but that's kind of a fun return to form. Like I, I really, I really, really enjoyed the past three weeks. Um, like I think we got really deep into some theory. I know last week was really talky and my goal for this week was to get back on the workbench and build some things and try some things and try some code. And we certainly did. We, we built some things. We broke some things. I'm sorry I couldn't let out as much smoke and fire as some of y'all wanted um but uh, you know that's that's just only to be only to be hoped for it so, so maybe next week maybe if we if we bring some real candles into the mix we can actually light some things on fire i'm not going to do that mary if you're watching i'm not going to do that um but yeah thanks for thanks for another great week chris never apologized for the random tangents um that's part of what makes these nights fun and honestly partly why i'm trying to focus a little more each week on specific topics so that like so that we do have time to take tangents and try things out because i i think that's part of the value of doing these live instead of just like recording them and dumping them somewhere like this is super cool um but yeah Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe out there. Stay warm or stay cool, depending on where you are in this great country of ours. Drink water, take care of yourselves and each other, and I will see you next week. Thanks, y'all.